Section 44 of Essays, Book 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cynthia Moyer. Essays, Book 2, by Michel de Montaigne. Translated by Charles Cotton. Apology for Raymond Seban, Part 4. But to return to what I was upon before, we have for our part inconstancy, irresolution, incertitude, sorrow, superstition, solicitude of things to come even after we shall be no more, ambition, avarice, jealousy, envy, irregular, frantic, and untamed appetites, war, lying, disloyalty, detraction, and curiosity. Doubtless we have strangely overpaid this fine reason upon which we so much glorify ourselves, and this capacity of judging and knowing, if we have bought it at the price of this infinite number of passions to which we are eternally subject. Unless we shall also think fit, as even Socrates does, to add to the counterpoise that notable prerogative above beasts, that whereas nature has prescribed them certain seasons and limits for the delights of Venus, she has given us the reins at all hours and all seasons. Ut vinum aigrotis, quia prodest raro, nocet saepissime, melius est non adhibere omnino, quam spedubiae salutis, in apertam perniciem incurere, sic haud scio an melius fuerit humano generi motum istum celerem cogitationis, acumen solertiam, quam rationem vocamus, quoniam pestifera sint multis, ad modum paucis salutaria, non dari omnino, quam tam munifice et tam largae dari. As it falls out that wine often hurting the sick, and very rarely doing them good, it is better not to give them any at all than to run into an apparent danger out of hope of an uncertain benefit. So I know not whether it had not been better for mankind that this quick motion this penetration, this subtlety that we call reason, had not been given to man at all, considering how pestiferous it is to many, and useful but to few, than to have been conferred in so abundant manner and with so liberal a hand. Of what advantage can we conceive the knowledge of so many things was to Varro and Aristotle? Did it exempt them from human inconveniences? Were they by it freed from the accidents that lay heavy upon the shoulders of a porter? Did they extract from their logic any consolation for the gout? Or for knowing how this humor is lodged in the joints, did they feel it the less? Did they enter into composition with death? by knowing that some nations rejoice at his approach, or with cuckoldry, by knowing that in some parts of the world wives are in common. On the contrary, having been reputed the greatest men for knowledge, the one amongst the Romans and the other amongst the Greeks, and in a time when learning did most flourish, we have not heard, nevertheless, that they had any particular excellence in their lives. Nay, the Greek had enough to do to clear himself from some notable blemishes in his. 
have we observed that pleasure and health have a better relish with him that understands astrology and grammar than with others illiterati num minus nervi rigent the illiterate ploughman is as fit for venus's service as the wit or shame and poverty less troublesome to the first than to the last scilicet et morbis et debilitate carebis et luctam et cura mefugies et tempora vitae longa tibi post haec fato meliore dabuntur disease thy couch shall flee and sorrow and care yes thou be sure wilt see long years of happiness till now unknown i have known in my time a hundred artisans a hundred laborers wiser and more happy than the rectors of the university and whom i had much rather have resembled learning methinks has its place amongst the necessary things of life as glory nobility dignity or at the most as beauty riches and such other qualities which indeed are useful to it but remotely and more by opinion than by nature we stand very little more in need of offices rules and laws of living in our society than cranes and ants do in theirs and yet we see that these carry themselves very regularly without erudition if man was wise he would take the true value of everything according as it was useful and proper to his life whoever will number us by our actions and deportments will find many more excellent men amongst the ignorant than among the learned ay in all sorts of virtue old rome seems to me to have been of much greater value both for peace and war than that learned rome that ruined itself and though all the rest should be equal yet integrity and innocency would remain to the ancients for they cohabit singularly well with simplicity but i will leave this discourse that would lead me farther than i am willing to follow and shall only say this further tis only humility and submission that can make a complete good man we are not to leave the knowledge of his duty to every man's own judgment we are to prescribe it to him and not suffer him to choose it at his own discretion otherwise according to the imbecility and infinite variety of our reasons and opinions we should at large forge ourselves duties that would as epicurus says enjoin us to eat one another the first law that ever god gave to man was a law of pure obedience it was a commandment naked and simple wherein man had nothing to inquire after nor to dispute for as much as to obey is the proper office of a rational soul acknowledging a heavenly superior and benefactor from obedience and submission spring all other virtues as all sin does from self-opinion and on the contrary the first temptation that by the devil was offered to human nature its first poison insinuated itself into us by the promise made us of knowledge and wisdom eritis sicut dii scientes bonum et malum ye shall be as gods knowing good and evil and the sirens in homer to allure ulysses and draw him within the danger of their snares offered to give him knowledge the plague of man is the opinion of wisdom and for this reason it is that 
ignorance is so recommended to us by our religion as proper to faith and obedience cavate ne quis vos decipiat per philosophiam et inanes seductiones secundum elementa mundi take heed lest any man deceive you by philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men and the rudiments of the world there is in this a general consent amongst all sorts of philosophers that the sovereign good consists in the tranquillity of the soul and body but where shall we find it ad sumum sapiens uno minor est jove dives liber honoratus pulcher rex denique regum praecipue sanus nisi compituita molesta est in short the wise is only less than jove rich free and handsome nay a king above all earthly kings with health supremely blessed excepting when a cold disturbs his rest it seems in truth that nature for the consolation of our miserable and wretched state has only given us presumption for our inheritance tis as epictetus says that man has nothing properly his own but the use of his opinion we have nothing but wind and smoke for our portion the gods have health in essence says philosophy and sickness in intelligence man on the contrary possesses his goods by fancy his ills in essence we have reason to magnify the power of our imagination for all our goods are only in dream hear this poor calamitous animal huff there is nothing says cicero so charming as the employment of letters of letters i say by means whereof the infinity of things the immense grandeur of nature the heavens even in this world the earth and the seas are discovered to us tis they that have taught us religion moderation and the grandeur of courage and that have rescued our souls from darkness to make her see all things high low first last and middling tis they that furnish us wherewith to live happily and well and conduct us to pass over our lives without displeasure and without offence does not this man seem to speak of the condition of the ever-living and almighty god but as to effects a thousand little country women have lived lives more equal more sweet and constant than his deus ille fuit deus in clute memi qui princeps vitae rationem invenit eam quae nunc appellator sapientem quique per artem fluctibus et tantis vitam tantisque tenebris in tam tranquillo et tam clara luce locavit that god great memus was a god no doubt who prince of life first found that reason out now wisdom called and by his art who did that life in tempests tossed and darkness hid place in so great a calm and clear a light here are brave ranting words but a very slight accident put this man's understanding in a worse condition than that of the meanest shepherd notwithstanding this instructing god this divine wisdom of the same stamp and impudence is the promise of democritus's book i am going to speak of all things and that 
foolish title that aristotle prefixes to one of his order only afforded him a few lucid intervals which he employed in composing his book and at last made him kill himself eusebius's chronicon of the mortal gods and the judgment of chrysippus that dion was as virtuous as god and my seneca himself says that god had given him life but that to live well was his own conformably to this other in virtute vere gloriamur quod non contingeret si id donum a deo non a nobis haberemus we truly glory in our virtue which would not be if it was given us of god and not by ourselves this is also seneca's saying that the wise man hath fortitude equal with god but that his is in spite of human frailty wherein therefore he more than equals god there is nothing so ordinary as to meet with sallies of the like temerity there is none of us who take so much offence to see himself equalled with god as he does to see himself undervalued by being ranked with other creatures so much more are we jealous of our own interest than that of our creator but we must trample under foot this foolish vanity and briskly and boldly shake the ridiculous foundation upon which these false opinions are founded so long as man shall believe he has any means and power of himself he will never acknowledge what he owes to his maker his eggs shall always be chickens as the saying is we must therefore strip him to his shirt let us see some notable examples of the effects of his philosophy posidonius being tormented with a disease so painful as made him writhe his arms and gnash his teeth thought he sufficiently scorned the dolor by crying out against it thou mayst do thy worst i will not confess that thou art an evil he was as sensible of the pain as my footman but he made a bravado of bridling his tongue at least and restraining it within the laws of his sect re secumbere non oportebat verbis gloriantem it did not become him that spoke so big to confess his frailty when he came to the test arcesilaus being ill of the gout and carneades who had come to see him going away troubled at his condition he called him back and showing him his feet and breast there is nothing comes thence hither said he this has something a better grace for he feels himself in pain and would be disengaged from it but his heart notwithstanding is not conquered nor subdued by it the other stands more obstinately to his point but i fear rather verbally than really and dionysius heracleotes afflicted with a vehement smarting in his eyes was reduced to quit these stoical resolutions but even though knowledge should in effect do as they say and could blunt the point and dull the edge of the misfortunes that attend us what does she more than what ignorance does more purely and evidently the philosopher pyrrho being at sea in very great danger by reason of a mighty storm presented nothing to the imitation of those who were with him in that extremity 
but a hog they had on board that was fearless and unconcerned at the tempest philosophy when she has said all she can refers us at last to the example of a gladiator wrestler or muleteer in which sort of people we commonly observe much less apprehension of death sense of pain and other inconveniences and more of endurance than ever knowledge furnished any one withal that was not born and bred to hardship what is the cause that we make incisions and cut the tender limbs of an infant and those of a horse more easily than our own but ignorance only how many has mere force of imagination made sick we often see men cause themselves to be let blood purged and physicked to be cured of diseases they only feel in opinion when real infirmities fail us knowledge lends us hers that color that complexion portend some catarus defluxion this hot season threatens us with a fever this breach in the lifeline of your left hand gives you notice of some near and dangerous indisposition and at last she roundly attacks health itself saying this sprightliness and vigor of youth cannot continue in this posture there must be blood taken and the heat abated lest it turn against yourself compare the life of a man subjected to such imaginations to that of a laborer that suffers himself to be led by his natural appetite measuring things only by the present sense without knowledge and without prognostic that feels no pain or sickness but when he is really ill whereas the other has the stone in his soul before he has it in his bladder as if it were not time enough to suffer the evil when it shall come he must anticipate it by fancy and run to meet it what i say of physic may generally serve in example for all other sciences thence is derived that ancient opinion of the philosophers that placed the sovereign good in the discovery of the weakness of our judgment my ignorance affords me as much occasion of hope as of fear and having no other rule for my health than that of the examples of others and of events i see elsewhere upon the like occasion i find of all sorts and rely upon those which by comparison are most favorable to me i receive health with open arms free full and entire and by so much the more whet my appetite to enjoy it by how much it is at present less ordinary and more rare so far am i from troubling its repose and sweetness with the bitterness of a new and constrained manner of living beasts sufficiently show us how much the agitation of our minds brings infirmities and diseases upon us that which is told us of those of brazil that they never die but of old age is attributed to the serenity and tranquillity of the air they live in but i rather attribute it to the serenity and tranquillity of their souls free from all passion thought or employment extended or unpleasing a people that pass over their lives in a wonderful simplicity and ignorance without letters without law without king or any manner of religion and whence comes that which we find by experience that the heaviest and dullest men are most able and the most to be desired in amorous performances and that 
the love of a muleteer often renders itself more acceptable than that of a gentleman if it be not that the agitation of the soul in the latter disturbs his physical ability dissolves and tires it as it also ordinarily troubles and tires itself what puts the soul beside itself and more usually throws it into madness but her own promptness vigor and agility and finally her own proper force of what is the most subtle folly made but of the most subtle wisdom as great friendships spring from great enmities and vigorous health from mortal diseases so from the rare and vivid agitations of our souls proceed the most wonderful and most distracted frenzies tis but half a turn of the toe from the one to the other in the actions of madmen we see how infinitely madness resembles the most vigorous operations of the soul who does not know how indiscernible the difference is betwixt folly and the sprightly elevations of a free soul and the effects of a supreme and extraordinary virtue plato says that melancholy persons are the most capable of discipline and the most excellent and accordingly in none is there so great a propension to madness great wits are ruined by their own proper force and pliability into what a condition through his own agitation and promptness of fancy is one of the most judicious ingenious and nearest formed of any other italian poet to the air of the ancient and true poesy lately fallen has he not vast obligation to this vivacity that has destroyed him to this light that has blinded him to this exact and subtle apprehension of reason that has put him beside his own to this curious and laborious search after sciences that has reduced him to imbecility and to this rare aptitude to the exercises of the soul that has rendered him without exercise and without soul i was more angry if possible than compassionate to see him at ferrara in so pitiful a condition surviving himself forgetting both himself and his works which without his knowledge though before his face have been published unformed and incorrect would you have a man healthy would you have him regular and in a steady and secure posture muffle him up in the shades of stupidity and sloth we must be made beasts to be made wise and hoodwinked before we are fit to be led and if one shall tell me that the advantage of having a cold and dull sense of pain and other evils brings this disadvantage along with it to render us consequently less sensible also in the fruition of good and pleasure this is true but the misery of our condition is such that we have not so much to enjoy as to avoid and that the extremest pleasure does not affect us to the degree that a light grief does Signius homines bona quam mala sentiunt we are not so sensible of the most perfect health as we are of the least sickness pungit incute vix summa violatum plagula corpus quando valere nihil quem quam movet hoc juvat unum quod me non torcet latus aut pes caetera quisquam vix queat aut sanum sese aut sentire valentem the body with a little sting is grieved when the most perfect health is not perceived 
this only pleases me that spleen nor gout neither offend my side nor wring my foot excepting these scarce any one can tell or e'er observes when he's in health and well our well-being is nothing but the not being ill which is the reason why that sect of philosophers which sets the greatest value upon pleasure has yet fixed it chiefly in unconsciousness of pain to be freed from ill is the greatest good that man can hope for or desire as aeneas says nimium boni est cui nihil est mali for that every tickling and sting which are in certain pleasures and that seem to raise us above simple health and passiveness that active moving and i know not how itching and biting pleasure even that very pleasure itself aims at nothing but insensibility as its mark the appetite that carries us headlong to women's embraces has no other end but only to cure the torment of our ardent and furious desires and only requires to be glutted and laid at rest and delivered from the fever and so of the rest i say then that if simplicity conducts us to a state free from evil she leads us to a very happy one according to our condition and yet we are not to imagine it so stupid an insensibility as to be totally without sense for crantor had very good reason to controvert the insensibility of epicurus if founded so deep that the very first attack and birth of evils were not to be perceived i do not approve such an insensibility as is neither possible nor to be desired i am very well content not to be sick but if i am i would know that i am so and if a caustic be applied or incisions made in any part i would feel them in truth whoever would take away the knowledge and sense of evil would at the same time eradicate the sense of pleasure and finally annihilate man himself istut nihil dolore non sine magna mercede contingit immanitatis in animo stuporis in corpore an insensibility that is not to be purchased but at the price of inhumanity in the soul and of stupidity of the body evil appertains to man of course neither is pain always to be avoided nor pleasure always pursued tis a great advantage to the honour of ignorance that knowledge itself throws us into its arms when she finds herself puzzled to fortify us against the weight of evil she is constrained to come to this composition to give us the reins and permit us to fly into the lap of the other and to shelter ourselves under her protection from the strokes and injuries of fortune for what else is her meaning when she instructs us to divert our thoughts from the ills that press upon us and entertain them with the meditation of pleasures past and gone to comfort ourselves in present afflictions with the remembrance of fled delights and to call to our succour a vanished satisfaction to oppose it to the discomfort that lies heavy upon us levationes aigritudinum in avocatione a cogitanda molestia et revocatione ad contemplandas voluptates ponit he directs us to alleviate our grief and pains by rejecting unpleasant thoughts and recalling agreeable ideas 
if it be not that where her power fails she would supply it with policy and make use of sleight of hand where force of limbs will not serve her turn for not only to a philosopher but to any man in his right wits when he has upon him the thirst of a burning fever what satisfaction can it be to him to remember the pleasure he took in drinking greek wine a month ago it would rather only make matters worse to him che ricordarsi il ben doppia la noia the thinking of pleasure doubles trouble of the same stamp is this other counsel that philosophy gives only to remember the happiness that is past and to forget the misadventures we have undergone as if we had the science of oblivion in our own power and counsel wherein we are yet no more to seek suavis est laborum praeteritorum memoria sweet is the memory of bygone pain how does philosophy that should arm me to contend with fortune and steel my courage to trample all human adversities under foot arrive to this degree of cowardice to make me hide my head at this rate and save myself by these pitiful and ridiculous shifts for the memory represents to us not what we choose but what she pleases nay there is nothing that so much imprints anything in our memory as a desire to forget it and tis a good way to retain and keep anything safe in the soul to solicit her to lose it and this is false est situm in nobis ut et adversa quasi perpetua oblivione obruamos et secunda jucunde et suaviter meminerimus it is in our power to bury as it were in a perpetual oblivion all adverse accidents and to retain a pleasant and delightful memory of our successes and this is true memini etiam quae nolo obliwisci non possum quae volo i do also remember what i would not but i cannot forget what i would and whose counsel is this his qui se unie sapientem profiteri sit ausus who alone durst profess himself a wise man qui genus humanum ingenio superavit et omnes praestrinxit stellas exortus uti aeterius sol who from mankind the prize of knowledge won and put the stars out like the rising sun to empty and disfurnish the memory is not this the true way to ignorance iners malorum remedium ignorantia est ignorance is but a dull remedy for evils we find several other like precepts whereby we are permitted to borrow frivolous appearances from the vulgar where we find the strongest reason will not answer the purpose provided they administer satisfaction and comfort where they cannot cure the wound they are content to palliate and benumb it i believe they will not deny this that if they could add order and constancy in a state of life that could maintain itself in ease and pleasure by some debility of judgment they would accept it potare et spargere flores incipiam patiarque well in consultus haberi give me to drink and crowned with flowers despise the grave disgrace of being thought unwise there would be a great 
many philosophers of Lycus's mind, this man, being otherwise of very regular manners, living quietly and contentedly in his family, and not failing in any office of his duty, either towards his own or strangers, and very carefully preserving himself from hurtful things, became, nevertheless, by some distemper in his brain, possessed with a conceit that he was perpetually in the theatre, a spectator of the finest sights and the best comedies in the world, and being cured by the physicians of his frenzy, was hardly prevented from endeavouring by suit to compel them to restore him again to his pleasing imagination. Paul me ocidistis amici, non seruastis ait, cui sic extorta voluptas, et demptus per vim mentis gratissimus error. By heaven you've killed me, friends, outright, and not preserved me, since my dear delight and pleasing error, by my better sense, unhappily returned, is banished hence. With a madness like that of Thrasylaus, the son of Pythodorus, who made himself believe that all the ships that weighed anchor from the port of Piraeus, and that came into the haven, only made their voyages for his profit, congratulating them upon their successful navigation, and receiving them with the greatest joy. And when his brother, Crito, caused him to be restored to his better understanding, he infinitely regretted that sort of condition wherein he had lived with so much delight and free from all anxiety of mind. Tis according to the old Greek verse that there is a great deal of convenience in not being overwise. And Ecclesiastes, in much wisdom there is much sorrow. And who gets wisdom gets labor and trouble. Even that to which philosophy consents in general, that last remedy which she applies to all sorts of necessities, to put an end to the life we are not able to endure. Placet pare, non placet, quaecumque vis exi, pungit dolor, vel fodiat sane, si nudus es da jugulum, sin tectus armis vulcaniis, id est fortitudine resiste. Does it please? Obey it. Not please? Go where thou wilt. Does grief prick thee, nay, stab thee? If thou art naked, present thy throat. If covered with the arms of Vulcan, that is, fortitude, resist it. And this word, so used in the Greek festivals, aut bibat aut abeat, either drink or go, which sounds better upon the tongue of a Gascon, who naturally changes the B into V, than on that of Cicero. Vivere se rectinescis decere peritis, lucisti satis, edisti satis, atque bibisti. Tempus ab ire tibi est, ne potum largius aequo rideat et pulsit lascivia decentius aetas. If to live well and right thou dost not know, give way, and leave thy place to those that do. Thou'st eaten, drunk, and played to thy content. Tis time to make thy parting compliment, lest youth, more decent in their follies, scoff the nauseous scene, and hiss thee reeling off. What is it other than a confession of his impotency, and ascending back not only to ignorance, to be there in safety, but even to stupidity, insensibility, and non-entity. Democritum postquam matura vetustas 
admonuit memorem motus languescere mentis, sponte sua leto caput ovvius obtulet ipsa. Soon as, through age, Democritus did find a manifest decadence in his mind, he thought he now survived to his own wrong, and went to meet his death that stayed too long. Tis what Antisthenes said, that a man should either make provision of sense to understand, or of a halter to hang himself. And what Chrysippus alleged upon this saying of the poet Tyrteus, or to arrive at virtue, or at death. And Crates said, that love would be cured by hunger, if not by time and whoever disliked these two remedies, by a rope. That Sextius, of whom both Seneca and Plutarch speak with so high an encomium, having applied himself, all other things set aside, to the study of philosophy, resolved to throw himself into the sea, seeing the progress of his studies too tedious and slow. He ran to find death, since he could not overtake knowledge. These are the words of the law upon the subject. If peradventure some great inconvenience happen, for which there is no remedy, the haven is near, and a man may save himself by swimming out of his body as out of a leaky skiff. For tis the fear of dying and not the love of life that ties the fool to his body as life renders itself by simplicity more pleasant so more innocent and better also it renders it as i was saying before the simple and ignorant says saint paul raise themselves up to heaven and take possession of it and we with all our knowledge, plunge ourselves into the infernal abyss. I am neither swayed by Valentinian, a professed enemy to all learning and letters, nor by Licinius, both Roman emperors, who called them the poison and pest of all political government, nor by Mahomet, who, as tis said, interdicted all manner of learning to his followers. But the example of the great Lycurgus, and his authority, with the reverence of the divine Lacedaemonian policy, so great, so admirable, and so long flourishing in virtue and happiness, without any institution or practice of letters, ought certainly to be of very great weight. Such as return from the new world discovered by the Spaniards in our fathers' days, testify to us how much more honestly and regularly those nations live, without magistrate and without law, than ours do, where there are more officers and lawyers than there are of other sorts of men and business dicitatoria piene e di libelli, disamine e di carte di procure, hanno le mani e il seno e gran fasteri, diciosa di consili e di letture, per cui la facolta de poverelli non sono mai nella città sicure, hanno dietro e dinanzi ed ambi i lati, notai, procuratori e avvocati. Their bags were full of writs and of citations, of process, and of actions and arrests, of bills, of answers, and of replications, in courts of delegates and of requests, to grieve the simple sort with great vexations. They had, resorting to them as their guests, attending on their circuit and their journeys, scriveners and clerks, and lawyers and attorneys it was what a roman senator of the latter ages said 
that their predecessors breath stunk of garlic but their stomachs were perfumed with a good conscience and that on the contrary those of his time were all sweet odour without but stunk within of all sorts of vices that is to say as i interpret it that they abounded with learning and eloquence but were very defective in moral honesty in civility ignorance simplicity roughness are the natural companions of innocence curiosity subtlety knowledge bring malice in their train humility fear obedience and affability which are the principal things that support and maintain human society require an empty and docile soul and little presuming upon itself christians have a particular knowledge how natural and original an evil curiosity is in man the thirst of knowledge and the desire to become more wise was the first ruin of man and the way by which he precipitated himself into eternal damnation pride was his ruin and corruption tis pride that diverts him from the common path and makes him embrace novelties and rather choose to be head of a troop lost and wandering in the path of error to be a master and a teacher of lies than to be a disciple in the school of truth suffering himself to be led and guided by the hand of another in the right and beaten road tis peradventure the meaning of this old greek saying that superstition follows pride and obeys it as if it were a father he desidaimonia kathaper patri to tufo pethetai ah presumption how much dost thou hinder us after that socrates was told that the god of wisdom had assigned to him the title of sage he was astonished at it and searching and examining himself throughout could find no foundation for this divine judgment he knew others as just temperate valiant and learned as himself and more eloquent more handsome and more profitable to their country than he at last he concluded that he was not distinguished from others nor wise but only because he did not think himself so and that his god considered the opinion of knowledge and wisdom as a singular absurdity in man and that his best doctrine was the doctrine of ignorance and simplicity his best wisdom the sacred word declares those miserable among us who have an opinion of themselves dust and ashes says it to such what hast thou wherein to glorify thyself and in another place god has made man like unto a shadow of whom who can judge when by removing the light it shall be vanished man is a thing of nothing our force is so far from being able to comprehend the divine height that of the works of our creator those best bear his mark and are with better title his which we the least understand to meet with an incredible thing is an occasion to christians to believe and it is so much the more according to reason by how much it is against human reason if it were according to reason it would be no more a miracle and if it were according to example it would be no longer a singular thing melius scitur deus nesciendo god is better known by not knowing him says st augustine 
and Tacitus. Sanctius est ac reverentius de actis deorum credere, quam scire. It is more holy and reverent to believe the works of God than to know them. And Plato thinks there is something of impiety in inquiring too curiously into God, the world, and the first causes of things. Atque illum quidem parentem huius universitatis invenire, difficile, et quum jam inveneris indicare in vulgis nefas. To find out the parent of the world is very difficult, and when found out, to reveal him to the vulgar is sin, says Cicero. We talk indeed of power, truth, justice, which are words that signify some great thing, but that thing we neither see nor conceive at all. We say that God fears, that God is angry, that God loves. Immortalia mortali sermone notantes, giving to things immortal, mortal names. These are all agitations and emotions that cannot be in God according to our form, nor can we imagine them according to his. It only belongs to God to know himself and to interpret his own works. And he does it in our language, going out of himself to stoop to us who grovel upon the earth. How can prudence, which is the choice between good and evil, be properly attributed to him whom no evil can touch? How can reason and intelligence, which we make use of, to arrive by obscure at apparent things, seeing that nothing is obscure to him? How justice, which distributes to every one what appertains to him, a thing begot by the society and community of men, how is that in God? How temperance, which is the moderation of corporal pleasures, that have no place in the divinity? Fortitude to support pain, labor, and dangers, as little appertains to him as the rest. These three things have no access to him. For which reason Aristotle holds him equally exempt from virtue and vice. Neque gratia, neque ira teneri potest, quod quae talia essent, imbecilia essent omnia. He can neither be affected with favor nor indignation, because both these are the effects of frailty. The participation we have in the knowledge of truth, such as it is, is not acquired by our own force. God has sufficiently given us to understand that, by the witnesses he has chosen out of the common people, simple and ignorant men, that he has been pleased to employ to instruct us in his admirable secrets. Our faith is not of our own acquiring. Tis purely the gift of another's bounty. Tis not by meditation or by virtue of our own understanding that we have acquired our religion, but by foreign authority and command wherein the imbecility of our own judgment does more assist us than any force of it, and our blindness more than our clearness of sight. Tis more by the mediation of our ignorance than of our knowledge that we know anything of the divine wisdom. Tis no wonder if our natural and earthly parts cannot conceive that supernatural and heavenly knowledge. Let us bring nothing of our own but obedience and subjection, for, as it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent, 
where is the wise where is the scribe where is the disputer of this world hath not god made foolish the wisdom of this world for after that in the wisdom of god the world knew not god it pleased god by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe finally should i examine whether it be in the power of man to find out that which he seeks and if that quest wherein he has busied himself so many ages has enriched him with any new force or any solid truth i believe he will confess if he speaks from his conscience that all he has got by so long inquiry is only to have learned to know his own weakness we have only by a long study confirmed and verified the natural ignorance we were in before the same has fallen out to men truly wise which befalls the ears of corn they shoot and raise their heads high and pert whilst empty but when full and swelled with grain in maturity begin to flag and droop so men having tried and sounded all things and having found in that mass of knowledge and provision of so many various things nothing solid and firm and nothing but vanity have quitted their presumption and acknowledged their natural condition tis what Velleus reproaches cotta withal and cicero that they had learned of philo that they had learned nothing ferecides one of the seven sages writing to thales upon his deathbed i have said he given order to my people after my interment to carry my writings to thee if they please thee and the other sages publish if not suppress them they contain no certainty with which i myself am satisfied neither do i pretend to know the truth or to attain to it i rather open than discover things the wisest man that ever was being asked what he knew made answer he knew this that he knew nothing by which he verified what has been said that the greatest part of what we know is the least of what we do not that is to say that even what we think we know is but a piece and a very little one of our ignorance we know things in dreams says plato and are ignorant of them in truth omnes peneveteres nihil cognosci nihil percipi nihil sciri posse dixerunt angustos sensus imbeciles animos brevia curricula vitae almost all the ancients have declared that there is nothing to be known nothing to be perceived or understood the senses are too limited men's minds too weak and the course of life too short and of cicero himself who stood indebted to his learning for all he was worth valerius says that he began to disrelish letters in his old age and when at his studies it was with great independency upon any one party following what he thought probable now in one sect and then in another ever more wavering under the doubts of the academy dicendum est sed ita ut nihil affirmem quaeram omnia dubitans plerumque et mihi diffidens something i must say but so as to affirm nothing i inquire into all things but for the most part in doubt and distrust of myself end of section 44 
Section 45 of Essays, Book 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cynthia Moyer. Essays, Book 2, by Michel de Montaigne. Translated by Charles Cotton. Apology for Raymond Seban. Part 5. I should have too fair a game should I consider man in his common way of living and in gross. Yet I might do it by his own rule, who judges truth not by weight but by the number of votes. Let us set the people aside, qui vigilans stertit, mortua cui vita est prope iam vivo atque videnti. Half of his life by lazy sleeps possessed, and when awake his soul but nods at best. Who neither feel nor judge, and let most of their natural faculties lie idle. I will take man in his highest ground. Let us consider him in that little number of men, excellent and culled out from the rest, who, having been endowed with a remarkable and particular natural force, have moreover hardened and whetted it by care, study, and art, and raised it to the highest pitch of wisdom to which it can possibly arrive. They have adjusted their souls to all ways and all biases, have propped and supported them with all foreign helps proper for them, and enriched and adorned them with all they could borrow for their advantage, both within and without the world. Tis in these is placed the utmost and most supreme height to which human nature can attain. They have regulated the world with policies and laws. They have instructed it with arts and sciences, and by the example of their admirable manners. I shall make account of none but such men as these, their testimony and experience. Let us examine how far they have proceeded and where they stopped. The errors and defects that we shall find amongst these men the world may boldly avow as their own. Whoever goes in search of anything must come to this, either to say that he has found it, or that it is not to be found, or that he is yet upon the search. All philosophy is divided into these three kinds. Her design is to seek out truth, knowledge, and certainty. The peripatetics, epicureans, stoics, and others have thought they have found it. These established the sciences we have, and have treated of them as of certain knowledge. Clitomachus, Carneades, and the academics have despaired in their search, and concluded that truth could not be conceived by our understandings. The result of these is weakness and human ignorance. This sect has had the most and the most noble followers. Pyrrho and other skeptics or epichists, whose dogmas are held by many of the ancients to be taken from Homer, the seven sages, and from Archilochus and Euripides, and to whose number these are added, Zeno, Democritus, and Xenophanes, say that they are yet upon the inquiry after truth. These conclude that the others who think they have found it out are infinitely deceived, and that it is too daring a vanity in the second sort to determine that human reason is not able to attain unto it. For this establishing a standard of our power, to know and judge the difficulty of things, 
is a great and extreme knowledge of which they doubt whether man is capable nil sciri quis quis putat id quoque nescit an sciri posit quam se nil scire fatetur he that says nothing can be known or throws his own opinion for he nothing knows so knows not that the ignorance that knows itself judges and condemns itself is not an absolute ignorance to be such it must be ignorant of itself so that the profession of the pironians is to waver doubt and inquire not to make themselves sure of or responsible to themselves for anything of the three actions of the soul imaginative appetitive and consentive they receive the two first the last they kept ambiguous without inclination or approbation either of one thing or another so light as it is zeno represented the motion of his imagination upon these divisions of the faculties of the soul thus an open and expanded hand signified appearance a hand half shut and the fingers a little bending consent a clenched fist comprehension when with the left he yet thrust the right fist closer knowledge now this situation of their judgment upright and inflexible receiving all objects without application or consent leads them to their ataraxy which is a peaceable condition of life temperate and exempt from the agitations we receive by the impression of opinion and knowledge that we think we have of things whence spring fear avarice envy immoderate desires ambition pride superstition love of novelty rebellion disobedience obstinacy and the greatest part of bodily ills nay and by that they are exempt from the jealousy of their discipline for they debate after a very gentle manner they fear no requital in their disputes when they affirm that heavy things descend they would be sorry to be believed and love to be contradicted to engender doubt and suspense of judgment which is their end they only put forward their propositions to contend with those they think we have in our belief if you take their arguments they will as readily maintain the contrary tis all one to them they have no choice if you maintain that snow is black they will argue on the contrary that it is white if you say it is neither the one nor the other they will maintain that it is both if you hold of certain judgment that you know nothing they will maintain that you do yea and if by an affirmative axiom you assure them that you doubt they will argue against you that you doubt not or that you cannot judge and determine that you doubt and by this extremity of doubt which jostles itself they separate and divide themselves from many opinions even of those they have several ways maintained both concerning doubt and ignorance why shall not they be allowed to doubt say they as well as the dogmatists one of whom says green another yellow can anything be proposed to us to grant or deny which it shall not be permitted to consider as ambiguous and where others are carried away either by the custom of their country or by the instruction of parents or by accident as by a tempest without judgment and without choice nay and for the most part before the age of discretion 
to such and such an opinion, to the sect whether Stoic or Epicurean, with which they are prepossessed, enslaved, and fast bound, as to a thing they cannot forsake. Ad quam cunque disciplinam velut tempestate dilati, ad eam tanquam ad saxum ad haerescunt. Every one cleaves to the doctrine he has happened upon, as to a rock against which he has been thrown by tempest. Why shall not these likewise be permitted to maintain their liberty and consider things without obligation or slavery? Hoc liberioris et solutioris, quod integra illis est judicandi potestas. In this, more unconstrained and free, because they have the greater power of judging. Is it not of some advantage to be disengaged from the necessity that curbs others? Is it not better to remain in suspense than to entangle oneself in the innumerable errors that human fancy has produced? Is it not much better to suspend one's persuasion than to intermeddle with these wrangling and seditious divisions? What shall I choose? What you please, provided you will choose. A very foolish answer, but such a one, nevertheless, as all dogmatism seems to point at, and by which we are not permitted to be ignorant of what we are ignorant of. Take the most eminent side, that of the greatest reputation. It will never be so sure that you shall not be forced to attack and contend with a hundred and a hundred adversaries to defend it. Is it not better to keep out of this hurly-burly? You are permitted to embrace Aristotle's opinions of the immortality of the soul with as much zeal as your honor and life, and to give the lie to Plato thereupon, and shall they be interdicted to doubt him? If it be lawful for Panaetius to maintain his opinion about augury, dreams, oracles, vaticinations, of which the Stoics made no doubt at all, why may not a wise man dare to do the same in all things that he dared to do in those he had learned of his masters, established by the common consent of the school whereof he is a professor and a member? If it be a child that judges, he knows not what it is. If a wise man, he is prepossessed. They have reserved for themselves a marvellous advantage in battle, having eased themselves of the care of defence. If you strike them, they care not, provided they strike too, and they turn everything to their own use. If they overcome, your argument is lame, if you theirs. If they fall short, they verify ignorance. If you fall short, you do it. If they prove that nothing is known, tis well. If they cannot prove it, tis also well. Ut cum in eadem re paria contrariis in partibus momenta inveniuntur, facilius abutraque parte assertio sustineatur that when like sentiments happen, pro and con, in the same thing, the assent may, on both sides, be more easily suspended. And they make account to find out, with much greater facility, why a thing is false than why tis true, that which is not than that which is, and what they do not believe than what they do. Their way of speaking is, I assert nothing, it is no more so than so, or than neither one nor t'other. I understand it not, 
appearances are everywhere equal, the law of speaking, pro or con, is the same. Nothing seems true that may not seem false. Their sacramental word is epecho, that is to say, I hold, I stir not. This is the burden of their song and others of like stuff, the effect of which is a pure, entire, perfect, and absolute suspension of judgment. They make use of their reason to inquire and debate, but not to fix and determine. Whoever shall imagine a perpetual confession of ignorance, a judgment without bias, propension, or inclination, upon any occasion whatever, conceives a true idea of Pyrrhonism. I express this fancy as well as I can by reason that many find it hard to conceive, and the authors themselves represent it a little variously and obscurely. As to what concerns the actions of life, they are in this of the common fashion. They yield and give up themselves to their natural inclinations, to the power and impulse of passions, to the constitution of laws and customs, and to the tradition of arts. Non enim nos Deus istascire sed tantum modo uti voluit. For God would not have us know, but only use those things. They suffer their ordinary actions to be guided by those things without any dispute or judgment. For which reason I cannot consent to what is said of Pyrrho by those who represent him heavy and immovable, leading a kind of savage and unsociable life, standing the jostle of carts, going upon the edge of precipices, and refusing to accommodate himself to the laws. This is to enhance upon his discipline. He would never make himself a stock or a stone. He would show himself a living man, discoursing, reasoning, enjoying all reasonable conveniences and pleasures, employing and making use of all his corporal and spiritual faculties in rule and reason. The fantastic, imaginary, and false privileges that man had usurped of lording it, ordaining, and establishing, he has utterly quitted and renounced. Yet there is no sect but is constrained to permit her sage to follow several things not comprehended, perceived, or consented to, if he means to live. And if he goes to sea, he follows that design not knowing whether his voyage shall be successful or no, and only insists upon the tightness of the vessel, the experience of the pilot, and the convenience of the season, and such probable circumstances, after which he is bound to go and suffer himself to be governed by appearances, provided there be no express and manifest contrariety in them. He has a body, he has a soul. The senses push them, the mind spurs them on. And although he does not find in himself this proper and singular sign of judging, and that he perceives that he ought not to engage his consent, considering that there may be some false equal to these true appearances, yet does he not, for all that, fail of carrying on the offices of his life with great liberty and convenience. How many arts are there that profess to consist more in conjecture than knowledge, that decide not on true and false, and only follow that which seems so? There are, say they, true and false, and we have in us wherewith to seek it, but not to make it stay when we touch it. 
we are much more prudent in letting ourselves be regulated by the order of the world without inquiry a soul clear from prejudice has a marvellous advance towards tranquillity and repose men that judge and control their judges do never duly submit to them how much more docile and easy to be governed both by the laws of religion and civil polity are simple and incurious minds than those over-vigilant wits that will still be prating of divine and human causes there is nothing in human invention that carries so great a show of likelihood and utility as this this presents man naked and empty confessing his natural weakness fit to receive some foreign force from above unfurnished of human and therefore more apt to receive into him the divine knowledge making naught of his own judgment to give more room to faith neither disbelieving nor establishing any dogma against common observances humble obedient disciplinable and studious a sworn enemy of heresy and consequently freeing himself from vain and irreligious opinions introduced by false sects tis a blank paper prepared to receive such forms from the finger of god as he shall please to write upon it the more we resign and commit ourselves to god and the more we renounce ourselves of the greater value we are take in good part says ecclesiastes the things that present themselves to thee as they seem and taste from hand to mouth the rest is out of thy knowledge dominus novit cogitationes hominum quoniam vanae sunt the lord knoweth the hearts of men that they are but vanity thus we see that of the three general sects of philosophy two make open profession of doubt and ignorance and in that of the dogmatists which is the third it is easy to discover that the greatest part of them only assume this face of confidence and assurance that they may produce the better effect they have not so much thought to establish any certainty for us as to show us how far they have proceeded in their search of truth quam docti fingunt magis quam norunt which the learned rather feign than know timaeus being to instruct socrates in what he knew of the gods the world and men proposes to speak to him as a man to a man and that it is sufficient if his reasons are probable as those of another for that exact reasons were neither in his nor any other mortal hand which one of his followers has thus imitated ut potero explicabo nec tamen ut pythius apollo certa ut sint et fixa quae dixero sed ut homunculus probabilia conjectura sequens i will as well as i am able explain affirming yet not as the pythian oracle that what i say is fixed and certain but like a mere man that follows probabilities by conjecture and this upon the natural and common subject of the contempt of death he has elsewhere translated from the very words of plato si forte de deorum natura ortuque mundi deserentes minus id quod habemus in animo consequimur haut erit mirum aequum est enim meminisse et me qui diseram hominem esse et vos qui judicetis ut si probabilia dicentur nihil ultra requiratis 
if perchance when we discourse of the nature of god and the world's original we cannot do it as we desire it will be no great wonder for it is just you should remember that both i who speak and you who are to judge are men so that if probable things are delivered you shall require and expect no more Aristotle ordinarily heaps up a great number of other men's opinions and beliefs to compare them with his own, and to let us see how much he has gone beyond them, and how much nearer he approaches to the likelihood of truth. For truth is not to be judged by the authority and testimony of others, which made Epicurus religiously avoid quoting them in his writings. This is the prince of all dogmatists, and yet we are told by him that the more we know, the more we have room for doubt. In earnest, we sometimes see him shroud and muffle up himself in so thick and so inextricable an obscurity that we know not what to make of his advice. It is, in effect, a Pyrrhonism under a resolutive form. Here Cicero's protestation, who expounds to us another's fancy by his own. Qui requirunt quid de quaque re ipsi sentiamus, curiosius id faciunt quam necesse est. Haec in philosophia ratio contra omnia diserendi, nullamque rem aperte judicandi, profecta a Socrate, repetita ab arcesila, confirmata a carneade, usque ad nostram viget aetatem. He sumus, qui omnibus veris falsa quaedam adjuncta esse dicamus, tanta similitudine, ut in iis nulla insit certe judicandi et assentiendi nota. They who desire to know what we think of everything are therein more inquisitive than is necessary. This practice in philosophy of disputing against everything and of absolutely concluding nothing, begun by Socrates, repeated by Arcesilaus, and confirmed by Carneades, has continued in use even to our own times we are they who declare that there is so great a mixture of things false amongst all that are true and they so resemble one another that there can be in them no certain mark to direct us either to judge or assent why hath not aristotle only but most of the philosophers affected difficulty if not to set a greater value upon the vanity of the subject and amuse the curiosity of our minds by giving them this hollow and fleshless bone to pick clitomachus affirmed that he could never discover by carneades's writings what opinion he was of this was it that made epicurus affect to be abstruse and that procured Heraclitus the epithet of Scotenos. Difficulty is a coin the learned make use of, like jugglers, to conceal the vanity of their art, and which human sottishness easily takes for current pay. Clarus ob obscuram linguam magis inter inanes omnia enim stolidi magis admirantur amantque, in versis quae subverbis latitantia cernunt. Bombast and riddle best do puppies please, for fools admire and love such things as these, and a dull quibble, wrapped in dubious phrase, up to the height doth their wise wonder raise. Cicero reprehends some of his friends for giving more of their time 
to the study of astrology logic and geometry than they were really worth saying that they were by these diverted from the duties of life and more profitable and proper studies the cyrenaic philosophers in like manner despised physics and logic zeno in the very beginning of the books of the commonwealth declared all the liberal arts of no use chrysippus said that what plato and aristotle had writ concerning logic they had only done in sport and by way of exercise and could not believe that they spoke in earnest of so vain a thing plutarch says the same of metaphysics and epicurus would have said as much of rhetoric grammar poetry mathematics and natural philosophy excepted of all the sciences and socrates of them all excepting that which treats of manners and of life whatever any one required to be instructed in by him he would ever in the first place demand an account of the conditions of his life present and past which he examined and judged esteeming all other learning subsequent to that and supernumerary parum mihi placeant ea literae quae ad virtutem doctoribus nihil profuerunt that learning is in small repute with me which nothing profited the teachers themselves to virtue most of the arts have been in like manner decried by the same knowledge but they did not consider that it was from the purpose to exercise their wits in those very matters wherein there was no solid advantage as to the rest some have looked upon plato as a dogmatist others as a doubter others in some things the one and in other things the other socrates the conductor of his dialogues is eternally upon questions and stirring up disputes never determining never satisfying and professes to have no other science but that of opposing himself homer their author has equally laid the foundations of all the sects of philosophy to show how indifferent it was which way we should choose tis said that ten several sects sprung from plato yet in my opinion never did any instruction halt and stumble if his does not socrates said that midwives in taking upon them the trade of helping others to bring forth left the trade of bringing forth themselves and that by the title of a wise man or sage which the gods had conferred upon him he was disabled in his virile and mental love of the faculty of bringing forth contenting himself to help and assist those that could to open their nature anoint the passes and facilitate their birth to judge of the infant baptize nourish fortify swathe and circumcise it exercising and employing his understanding in the perils and fortunes of others it is so with the most part of this third sort of authors as the ancients have observed in the writings of anaxagoras democritus parmenides xenophanes and others they have a way of writing doubtful in substance and design rather inquiring than teaching though they mix their style with some dogmatical periods is not the same thing seen in seneca and plutarch how many contradictions are there to be found if a man pry narrowly into them so many that the reconciling lawyers ought first to reconcile them every one to themselves 
Plato seems to have affected this method of philosophizing in dialogues to the end that he might, with greater decency, from several mouths, deliver the diversity and variety of his own fancies. It is as well to treat variously of things as to treat of them conformably, and better, that is to say, more copiously and with greater profit. Let us take example from ourselves. Judgments are the utmost point of all dogmatical and determinative speaking, and yet those arets that our parliaments give the people, the most exemplary of them, and those most proper to nourish in them the reverence due to that dignity, principally through the sufficiency of the persons acting derive their beauty not so much from the conclusion, which with them is quotidian and common to every judge, as from the dispute and heat of diverse and contrary arguments that the matter of law and equity will permit. And the largest field for reprehension that some philosophers have against others is drawn from the diversities and contradictions wherein every one of them finds himself perplexed, either on purpose to show the vacillation of the human mind concerning everything, or ignorantly compelled by the volubility and incomprehensibility of all matter, which is the meaning of the maxim, in a slippery and sliding place let us suspend our belief, for, as Euripides says, God's various works perplex the thoughts of men. Like that which Empedocles, as if transported with a divine fury and compelled by truth, often strewed here and there in his writings, no, no, we feel nothing, we see nothing, all things are concealed from us, there is not one thing of which we can positively say what it is. According to the divine saying, Cogitationes mortalium timidae et incertae ad inventiones nostro et providentiae. For the thoughts of mortal men are doubtful, and our devices are but uncertain. It is not to be thought strange if men, despairing to overtake what they hunt after, have not, however, lost the pleasure of the chase. Study being of itself so pleasant an employment, and so pleasant that amongst the pleasures the Stoics forbid that also which proceeds from the exercise of the mind, will have it curbed and find a kind of intemperance in too much knowledge. Democritus, having eaten figs at his table that tasted of honey, fell presently to considering with himself whence they should derive this unusual sweetness, and, to be satisfied in it, was about to rise from the table to see the place whence the figs had been gathered, which his maid, observing, and having understood the cause, smilingly told him that he need not trouble himself about that, for she had put them into a vessel in which there had been honey. He was vexed at this discovery, and that she had deprived him of the occasion of this inquiry, and robbed his curiosity of matter to work upon. Go thy way, said he, thou hast done me an injury but for all that I will seek out the cause as if it were natural, and would willingly have found out some true reason for a false and imaginary effect. This story of a famous and great philosopher very clearly represents to us that studious passion that puts us upon the pursuit of things, of the acquisition of which we despair. Plutarch gives a like example of someone who would not be satisfied in that whereof he was in doubt, 
that he might not lose the pleasure of inquiring into it. Like the other who would not that his physician should allay the thirst of his fever, that he might not lose the pleasure of quenching it by drinking. Satius est supervacua discere quam nihil. Tis better to learn more than necessary than nothing at all. As in all sorts of feeding, the pleasure of eating is very often single and alone, and that what we take, which is acceptable to the palate, is not always nourishing or wholesome, so that which our minds extract from science does not cease to be pleasant, though there be nothing in it either nutritive or healthful. Thus they say, the consideration of nature is a diet proper for our minds. It raises and elevates us, makes us disdain low and terrestrial things, by comparing them with those that are celestial and high. The mere inquisition into great and occult things is very pleasant, even to those who acquire no other benefit than the reverence and fear of judging it. This is what they profess. The vain image of this sickly curiosity is yet more manifest in this other example which they so often urge. Eudoxus wished and begged of the gods that he might once see the sun near at hand to comprehend the form, greatness, and beauty of it, even though he should thereby be immediately burned. He would, at the price of his life, purchase a knowledge of which the use and possession should at the same time be taken from him, and for this sudden and vanishing knowledge lose all the other knowledge he had in present or might afterwards have acquired. I cannot easily persuade myself that Epicurus, Plato, and Pythagoras have given us their atom, idea, and numbers for current pay. They were too wise to establish their articles of faith upon things so disputable and uncertain. But in that obscurity and ignorance in which the world then was, every one of these great men endeavored to present some kind of image or reflection of light, and worked their brains for inventions that might have a pleasant and subtle appearance, provided that, though false, they might make good their ground against those that would oppose them. Unicuique ista pro ingenio finguntur, non ex scientiae vi. These things every one fancies according to his wit, and not by any power of knowledge. One of the ancients, who was reproached, that he professed philosophy, of which he nevertheless in his own judgment made no great account, made answer, that this was truly to philosophize. They wished to consider all, to balance everything, and found that an employment well suited to our natural curiosity. Some things they wrote for the benefit of public society, as their religions, and for that consideration it was but reasonable that they should not examine public opinions to the quick, that they might not disturb the common obedience to the laws and customs of their country. Plato treats of this mystery with a raillery manifest enough, for where he writes according to his own method he gives no certain rule. When he plays the legislator he borrows a magisterial and positive style and boldly there foists in his most fantastic inventions as fit to persuade the vulgar as impossible to be believed by himself, 
knowing very well how fit we are to receive all sorts of impressions, especially the most immoderate and preposterous. And yet, in his laws, he takes singular care that nothing be sung in public but poetry, of which the fiction and fabulous relations tend to some advantageous end it being so easy to imprint all sorts of phantasms in human minds that it were injustice not to feed them rather with profitable untruths than with untruths that are unprofitable and hurtful he says very roundly in his republic that it is often necessary for the benefit of men to deceive them it is very easy to distinguish that some of the sects have more followed truth and the others utility by which the last have gained their reputation tis the misery of our condition that often that which presents itself to our imagination for the truest does not appear the most useful to life the boldest sects as the epicurean Pironian and the new academic are yet constrained to submit to the civil law at the end of the account there are other subjects that they have tumbled and tossed about some to the right and others to the left every one endeavoring right or wrong to give them some kind of color for having found nothing so abstruse that they would not venture to speak of they are very often forced to forge weak and ridiculous conjectures not that they themselves looked upon them as any foundation or establishing any certain truth but merely for exercise non tam id sensise quod dicerent quam exercere ingenia materiae difficultate videntur voluese they seem not so much themselves to have believed what they said as to have had a mind to exercise their wits in the difficulty of the matter and if we did not take it thus how should we palliate so great inconstancy variety and vanity of opinions as we see have been produced by those excellent and admirable men as for example what can be more vain than to imagine to guess at god by our analogies and conjectures to direct and govern him and the world by our capacities and our laws and to serve ourselves at the expense of the divinity with what small portion of capacity he has been pleased to impart to our natural condition and because we cannot extend our sight to his glorious throne to have brought him down to our corruption and our miseries of all human and ancient opinions concerning religion that seems to me the most likely and most excusable that acknowledged god as an incomprehensible power the original and preserver of all things all goodness all perfection receiving and taking in good part the honor and reverence that man paid him under what method name or ceremonies soever Jupiter omnipotens rerum regumque deumque progenitor genitrixque. Jove the Almighty, author of all things, the father, mother of both gods and kings. This zeal has universally been looked upon from heaven with a gracious eye. All governments have reaped fruit from their devotion impious men and actions have everywhere had suitable events pagan histories acknowledge dignity order justice prodigies and oracles employed for their profit and instruction in their fabulous religions 
god through his mercy vouchsafing by these temporal benefits to cherish the tender principles of a kind of brutish knowledge that natural reason gave them of him through the deceiving images of their dreams not only deceiving and false but impious also and injurious are those that man has forged from his own invention and of all the religions that saint paul found in repute at athens that which they had dedicated to the unknown god seemed to him the most to be excused pythagoras shadowed the truth a little more closely judging that the knowledge of this first cause and being of beings ought to be indefinite without limitation without declaration that it was nothing else than the extreme effort of our imagination towards perfection every one amplifying the idea according to the talent of his capacity but if numa attempted to conform the devotion of his people to this project to attach them to a religion purely mental without any prefixed object and material mixture he undertook a thing of no use the human mind could never support itself floating in such an infinity of in-form thoughts there is required some certain image to be presented according to its own model the divine majesty has thus in some sort suffered himself to be circumscribed in corporal limits for our advantage his supernatural and celestial sacraments have signs of our earthly condition his adoration is by sensible offices and words for tis man that believes and prays i shall omit the other arguments upon this subject but a man would have much ado to make me believe that the sight of our crucifixes that the picture of our saviour's passion that the ornaments and ceremonious motions of our churches that the voices accommodated to the devotion of our thoughts and that emotion of the senses do not warm the souls of the people with a religious passion of very advantageous effect of those to whom they have given a body as necessity required in that universal blindness i should i fancy most inclined to those who adored the sun la lumière commune l'oeil du mont est si dieu au chef porte des yeux les rayons du soleil sont ses yeux radieux qui dans vie à tous nous maintient et garde et la fée des humains en ces mondes regarde c'est beau ce grand soleil qui nous fait les saisons selon qu'il entre ou sort de ses douze maisons qui remplit l'univers de ses vertus connues qui d'un trait de ses yeux nous dissipe les nuées l'esprit l'âme du monde ardent et flamboyant en la course d'un jour tout le ciel tournoyant plein d'immenses grandeurs rend vagabond et ferme le cœur tient des soupes lui tout le monde pour terme en repos sans repos voici et sans séjour fils aîné de nature et le père du jour the common light that equal shines on all diffused around the whole terrestrial ball and if the almighty ruler of the skies has eyes the sunbeams are his radiant eyes that life and safety give to young and old 
and all men's actions upon earth behold this great this beautiful the glorious sun who makes their course the varied seasons run that with his virtues fills the universe and with one glance can sullen clouds disperse earth's life and soul that flaming in his sphere surrounds the heavens in one day's career immensely great moving yet firm and round who the whole world below has made his bound at rest without rest idle without stay nature's first son and father of the day forasmuch as beside this grandeur and beauty of his tis the only piece of this machine that we discover at the remotest distance from us and by that means so little known that they were pardonable for entering into so great admiration and reverence of it thales who first inquired into this sort of matter believed god to be a spirit that made all things of water anaximander that the gods were always dying and entering into life again and that there were an infinite number of worlds anaximenes that the air was god that he was procreate and immense always moving anaxagoras the first was of opinion that the description and manner of all things were conducted by the power and reason of an infinite spirit alcmaeon gave divinity to the sun moon and stars and to the soul pythagoras made god a spirit spread over the nature of all things whence our souls are extracted parmenides a circle surrounding the heaven and supporting the world by the ardor of light empedocles pronounced the four elements of which all things are composed to be gods protagoras had nothing to say whether they were or were not or what they were democritus was one while of opinion that the images and their circuitions were gods another while the nature that darts out those images and then our science and intelligence plato divides his belief into several opinions he says in his timaeus that the father of the world cannot be named in his laws that men are not to inquire into his being and elsewhere in the very same books he makes the world the heavens the stars the earth and our souls gods admitting moreover those which have been received by ancient institution in every republic xenophon reports a like perplexity in socrates's doctrine one while that men are not to inquire into the form of god and presently makes him maintain that the sun is god and the soul god that there is but one god and then that there are many spusippus the nephew of plato makes god a certain power governing all things and that he has a soul aristotle one while says it is the spirit and another the world one while he gives the world another master and another while makes god the heat of heaven xenocrates makes eight five named amongst the planets the sixth composed of all the fixed stars as of so many members the seventh and eighth the sun and moon heraclides ponticus does nothing but float in his opinion and finally deprives god of sense and makes him shift from one form to another and at last says that it is heaven and earth 
theophrastus wanders in the same irresolution amongst his fancies attributing the superintendency of the world one while to the understanding another while to heaven and then to the stars strato says that tis nature she having the power of generation augmentation and diminution without form and sentiment zeno says tis the law of nature commanding good and prohibiting evil which law is an animal and takes away the accustomed gods jupiter juno and vesta diogenes apolloniates that tis air xenophanes makes god round seeing and hearing not breathing and having nothing in common with human nature aristo thinks the form of god to be incomprehensible deprives him of sense and knows not whether he be an animal or something else cleanthes one while supposes it to be reason another while the world another the soul of nature and then the supreme heat rolling about and environing all perseus zeno's disciple was of opinion that men have given the title of gods to such as have been useful and have added any notable advantage to human life and even to profitable things themselves chrysippus made a confused heap of all the preceding theories and reckons amongst a thousand forms of gods that he makes the men also that have been deified diagoras and theodorus flatly denied that there were any gods at all epicurus makes the gods shining transparent and perfluble lodged as betwixt two forts betwixt two worlds secure from blows clothed in a human figure and with such members as we have which members are to them of no use ego deum genus esse semper duxi et dicam celetum sed eos non curare opinor quid agat humanum genus i ever thought that gods above there were but do not think they care what men do here trust to your philosophy my masters and brag that you have found the bean in the cake when you see what a rattle is here with so many philosophical heads the perplexity of so many worldly forms has gained this over me that manners and opinions contrary to mine do not so much displease as instruct me nor so much make me proud as they humble me in comparing them and all other choice than what comes from the express and immediate hand of god seems to me a choice of very little privilege the policies of the world are no less opposite upon this subject than the schools by which we may understand that fortune itself is not more variable and inconstant nor more blind and inconsiderate than our reason the things that are most unknown are most proper to be deified wherefore to make gods of ourselves as the ancients did exceeds the extremest weakness of understanding i would much rather have gone along with those who adored the serpent the dog or the ox for as much as their nature and being is less known to us and that we have more room to imagine what we please of those beasts and to attribute to them extraordinary faculties but to have made gods of our own condition of whom we ought to know the imperfections and to have attributed to them desire anger revenge 
marriages, generation, alliances, love, jealousy, our members and bones, our fevers and pleasures, our death and obsequies. This must needs have proceeded from a marvellous inebriety of the human understanding. Quae proculusque adeo divino ab numine distant, in que deum numero quae sint indigna videri. From divine natures these so distant are, they are unworthy of that character. Formae aetates vestitus ornatus noti sunt, genera conjugia cognationes omniaque traducta ad similitudinem imbecilitatis humanae, nam et perturbatis animis inducuntur, accipimus enum deorum cupiditates aegritudines iracundias. Their forms, ages, clothes, and ornaments are known, their descents, marriages, and kindred, and all adapted to the similitude of human weakness, for they are represented to us with anxious minds, and we read of the lusts, sickness, and anger of the gods. As having attributed divinity not only to faith, virtue, honor, concord, liberty, victory, and piety, but also to voluptuousness, fraud, death, envy, old age, misery, to fear, fever, ill fortune, and other injuries of our frail and transitory life. Quid juvat hoc templis nostros inducere mores, o curvae in teris animae et celestium inanes? O earth-born souls, by earth-born passions led, to every spark of heavenly influence dead, think ye that what man values will inspire in minds celestial the same base desire. The Egyptians, with an impudent prudence, interdicted upon pain of hanging that any one should say that their gods Serapis and Isis had formerly been men, and yet no one was ignorant that they had been such, and their effigies, represented with the finger upon the mouth, signified says Waro, that mysterious decree to their priests to conceal their mortal original, as it must, by necessary consequence, cancel all the veneration paid to them. Seeing that man so much desired to equal himself to God, he had done better, says Cicero, to have attracted those divine conditions to himself and drawn them down hither below, than to send his corruption and misery up on high. But to take it right, he has several ways done both the one and the other, with like vanity of opinion. End of section 45 Section 46 of Essays, Book 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cynthia Moyer. Essays, Book 2. By Michel de Montaigne. Translated by Charles Cotton. Apology for Raymond Sebon, Part Six. When philosophers search narrowly into the hierarchy of their gods and make a great bustle about distinguishing their alliances, offices, and power, I cannot believe they speak as they think. 
when plato describes pluto's orchard to us and the bodily conveniences or pains that attend us after the ruin and annihilation of our bodies and accommodates them to the feeling we have in this life secreti celant cales et myrtea circum silva tegit curae non ipsa in morte relinquunt in secret vales and myrtle groves they lie nor do cares leave them even when they die when mahomet promises his followers a paradise hung with tapestry gilded and enamelled with gold and precious stones furnished with wenches of excelling beauty rare wines and delicate dishes it is easily discerned that these are deceivers that accommodate their promises to our sensuality to attract and allure us by hopes and opinions suitable to our mortal appetites and yet some amongst us are fallen into the like error promising to themselves after the resurrection a terrestrial and temporal life accompanied with all sorts of worldly conveniences and pleasures can we believe that plato he who had such heavenly conceptions and was so well acquainted with the divinity as thence to derive the name of the divine plato ever thought that the poor creature man had anything in him applicable to that incomprehensible power and that he believed that the weak holds we are able to take were capable or the force of our understanding sufficient to participate of beatitude or eternal pains we should then tell him from human reason if the pleasures thou dost promise us in the other life are of the same kind that i have enjoyed here below this has nothing in common with infinity though all my five natural senses should be even loaded with pleasure and my soul full of all the contentment it could hope or desire we know what all this amounts to all this would be nothing if there be anything of mine there there is nothing divine if this be no more than what may belong to our present condition it cannot be of any value all contentment of mortals is mortal even the knowledge of our parents children and friends if that can affect and delight us in the other world if that still continues a satisfaction to us there we still remain in earthly and finite conveniences we cannot as we ought conceive the greatness of these high and divine promises if we could in any sort conceive them to have a worthy imagination of them we must imagine them unimaginable inexplicable and incomprehensible and absolutely another thing than those of our miserable experience i hath not seen saith saint paul nor ear heard neither hath entered into the heart of man the things that god hath prepared for them that love him and if to render us capable our being were reformed and changed as thou plato sayest by thy purifications it ought to be so extreme and total a change that by physical doctrine it be no more us hector erat tunc cum bello certabat at ille tractus ab aemonio non erat hector equo he hector was whilst he could fight but when dragged by achilles steeds no hector then it must be something else that must receive these recompenses 
quod mutatur dissolvitur enterit ergo traiciuntur enim partes atque ordine migrant things changed dissolved are and therefore die their parts are mixed and from their order fly for in pythagoras's metempsychosis and the change of habitation that he imagined in souls can we believe that the lion in whom the soul of caesar is enclosed does espouse caesar's passions or that the lion is he for if it was still caesar they would be in the right who controverting this opinion with plato reproach him that the son might be seen to ride his mother transformed into a mule and the like absurdities and can we believe that in the mutations that are made of the bodies of animals into others of the same kind the newcomers are not other than their predecessors from the ashes of a phoenix a worm they say is engendered and from that another phoenix who can imagine that this second phoenix is no other than the first we see our silkworms as it were die and wither and from this withered body a butterfly is produced and from that another worm how ridiculous would it be to imagine that this was still the first that which once has ceased to be is no more nec si materiam nostram collegerit aetas post obitum rursumque redegerit ut sita nunc est atque iterum nobis fuerint data lumina vitae pertineat quidquam tamen ad nos id quoque factum interrupta semel cum sit repetentia nostra neither though time should gather and restore our matter to the form it was before and give again new light to see withal would that new figure us concern at all or we again ever the same be seen our being having interrupted been and plato when thou sayest in another place that it shall be the spiritual part of man that will be concerned in the fruition of the recompense of another life thou tellest us a thing wherein there is as little appearance of truth scilicet avulsis radicibus ut nequit ulam dispicere ipsa oculus rem seorsum corpore toto no more than eyes once from their optics torn can ever after anything discern for by this account it would no more be man nor consequently us who would be concerned in this enjoyment for we are composed of two principal essential parts the separation of which is the death and ruin of our being inter enim jacta est vitae pausa vageque de erarunt passim motus absensibus omnes when once that pause of life is come between tis just the same as we had never been we cannot say that the man suffers when the worms feed upon his members and that the earth consumes them et nihil hoc ad nos qui coitu coniugioque corporis atque animae consistimus uniter apti what's that to us for we are only we while soul and body in one frame agree moreover upon what foundation of their justice can the gods take notice of or reward man after his death and virtuous actions since it was themselves that put them in the way and mind to do them 
and why should they be offended at or punish him for wicked ones since themselves have created in him so frail a condition and when with one glance of their will they might prevent him from falling might not epicurus with great color of human reason object this to plato did he not often save himself with this sentence that it is impossible to establish anything certain of the immortal nature by the mortal she does nothing but err throughout but especially when she meddles with divine things who does more evidently perceive this than we for although we have given her certain and infallible principles and though we have enlightened her steps with the sacred lamp of truth that it has pleased god to communicate to us we daily see nevertheless that if she swerve never so little from the ordinary path and that she stray from or wander out of the way set out and beaten by the church how soon she loses confounds and fetters herself tumbling and floating in this vast turbulent and waving sea of human opinions without restraint and without any determinate end so soon as she loses that great and common road she enters into a labyrinth of a thousand several paths man cannot be anything but what he is nor imagine beyond the reach of his capacity tis a greater presumption says plutarch in them who are but men to attempt to speak and discourse of the gods and demigods than it is in a man utterly ignorant of music to give an opinion of singing or in a man who never saw a camp to dispute about arms and martial affairs presuming by some light conjecture to understand the effects of an art he is totally a stranger to antiquity i believe thought to put a compliment upon and add something to the divine grandeur in assimilating it to man investing it with his faculties and adorning it with his ugly humors and most shameful necessities offering it our aliments to eat presenting it with our dances mummeries and farces to divert it with our vestments to cover it and our houses to inhabit coaxing it with the odor of incense and the sounds of music with festoons and nosegays and to accommodate it to our vicious passions flattering its justice with inhuman vengeance and with the ruin and dissipation of things by it created and preserved as tiberius sempronius who burnt the rich spoils and arms he had gained from the enemy in sardinia for a sacrifice to vulcan and paulus aemilius those of macedonia to mars and minerva and alexander arriving at the indian ocean threw several great vessels of gold into the sea in honor of thetes and moreover loading her altars with a slaughter not of innocent beasts only but of men also as several nations and ours among the rest were commonly used to do and i believe there is no nation under the sun that has not done the same sulmone creatos quatuor hic juenes totidem quos educat ufens viventes rapit inferias quos immolet umbris four sons of sulmo four whom ufens bred he took in flight and living victims led to please the ghost of pallas and expire in sacrifice before his funeral pyre the getae hold themselves to be immortal and that their death is nothing but a journey to their god zamolxis 
every five years they dispatch some one among them to him to entreat of him such necessaries as they stand in need of this envoy is chosen by lot and the form of dispatching him after he has been instructed by word of mouth what he is to deliver is that of the assistants three hold up as many javelins upon which the rest throw his body with all their force if he happen to be wounded in a mortal part and that he immediately dies tis held a certain argument of divine favor but if he escapes he is looked upon as a wicked and execrable wretch and another is dismissed after the same manner in his stead amestris the mother of xerxes being grown old caused at once fourteen young men of the best families of persia to be buried alive according to the religion of the country to gratify some infernal deity and even to this day the idols of temixtitan are cemented with the blood of little children and they delight in no sacrifice but of these pure and infantine souls a justice thirsty of innocent blood tantum religio potuit suadere malorum such impious use was of religion made so many demon acts it could persuade the carthaginians immolated their own children to saturn and those who had none of their own bought of others the father and mother being in the meantime obliged to assist at the ceremony with a gay and contented countenance it was a strange fancy to think to gratify the divine bounty with our afflictions like the lacedaemonians who regaled their diana with the tormenting of young boys whom they caused to be whipped for her sake very often to death it was a savage humour to imagine to gratify the architect by the subversion of his building and to think to take away the punishment due to the guilty by punishing the innocent and that poor iphigenia at the port of aulis should by her death and immolation acquit towards god the whole army of the greeks from all the crimes they had committed et casta inceste nubendi tempore in ipso hostia concideret mactatu moista parentis that the chaste virgin in her nuptial band should die by an unnatural father's hand and that the two noble and generous souls of the two decii the father and the son to incline the favour of the gods to be propitious to the affairs of rome should throw themselves headlong into the thickest of the enemy quae fuit tanta deorum iniquitas ut placari populo romano non possent nisi tales viri occidisent how great an injustice in the gods was it that they could not be reconciled to the people of rome unless such men perished to which may be added that it is not for the criminal to cause himself to be scourged according to his own measure nor at his own time but that it purely belongs to the judge who considers nothing as chastisements but the penalty that he appoints and cannot call that punishment which proceeds from the consent of him that suffers the divine vengeance presupposes an absolute dissent in us both for its justice and for our own penalty and therefore it was a ridiculous humour of polycrates tyrant of samos who to interrupt the continued course of his good fortune and to balance it went and threw the dearest and most precious jewel he had into the sea 
believing that by this voluntary and antedated mishap he bribed and satisfied the revolution and vicissitude of fortune and she to mock his folly ordered it so that the same jewel came again into his hands found in the belly of a fish and then to what end were those tearings and dismemberments of the corribantes the menades and in our times of the mahometans who slash their faces bosoms and limbs to gratify their profit seeing that the offence lies in the will not in the breast eyes genitals roundness of form the shoulders or the throat tantus est perturbatae mentis et sedibus suis pulsae furor ut sic dii placentur quem ad modum ne homines quidem saeviunt so great is the fury and madness of troubled minds when once displaced from the seat of reason as if the gods should be appeased with what even men are not so cruel as to approve the use of this natural contexture has not only respect to us but also to the service of god and other men tis as unjust for us voluntarily to wound or hurt it as to kill ourselves upon any pretence whatever it seems to be great cowardice and treason to exercise cruelty upon and to destroy the functions of the body that are stupid and servile to spare the soul the solicitude of governing them according to reason ubi iratos deus timent qui sic propitios habere merentur in regiae libidinis voluptatem castrati sunt quidam sed nemo sibi ne vir eset jubente domino manus intulit where are they so afraid of the anger of the gods as to merit their favour at that rate some indeed have been made eunuchs for the lust of princes but no man at his master's command has put his own hand to unman himself so did they fill their religion with several ill effects saepius olim religio peperit scelerosa atque impia facta in elder times religion did commit most fearful crimes now nothing of ours can in any sort be compared or likened unto the divine nature which will not blemish and stain it with much imperfection how can that infinite beauty power and goodness admit of any correspondence or similitude to such abject things as we are without extreme wrong and manifest dishonour to his divine greatness in firmum dei fortius est hominibus et stultum dei sapientius est hominibus for the foolishness of god is wiser than men and the weakness of god is stronger than men stilpo the philosopher being asked whether the gods were delighted with our adorations and sacrifices you are indiscreet answered he let us withdraw apart if you would talk of such things nevertheless we prescribe him bounds we keep his power besieged by our reasons i call our ravings and dreams reason with the dispensation of philosophy which says that the wicked man and even the fool go mad by reason but a particular form of reason we would subject him to the vain and feeble appearances of our understandings him who has made both us and our knowledge 
because that nothing is made of nothing god therefore could not make the world without matter what has god put into our hands the keys and most secret springs of his power is he obliged not to exceed the limits of our knowledge put the case o man that thou hast been able here to mark some footsteps of his effects dost thou therefore think that he has employed all he can and has crowded all his forms and ideas in this work thou seest nothing but the order and revolution of this little cave in which thou art lodged if indeed thou dost see so much whereas his divinity has an infinite jurisdiction beyond this part is nothing in comparison of the whole omnia cum celo terraque marisque nil sunt ad summam summae totius omnem the earth the sea and skies from pole to pole are small nay nothing to the mighty whole tis a municipal law that thou allegest thou knowest not what is universal tie thyself to that to which thou art subject but not him he is not of thy brotherhood thy fellow-citizen or companion if he has in some sort communicated himself unto thee tis not to debase himself unto thy littleness nor to make thee controller of his power the human body cannot fly to the clouds rules are for thee the sun runs every day his ordinary course the bounds of the sea and the earth cannot be confounded the water is unstable and without firmness a wall unless it be broken is impenetrable to a solid body a man cannot preserve his life in the flames he cannot be both in heaven and upon earth and corporally in a thousand places at once tis for thee that he has made these rules tis thee that they concern he has manifested to christians that he has enfranchised himself from them all when it pleased him and in truth why almighty as he is should he have limited his power within any certain bounds in favor of whom should he have renounced his privilege thy reason has in no other thing more of likelihood and foundation than in that wherein it persuades thee that there is a plurality of worlds teramque et solem lunam mare caetera quae sunt non esse unica sed numero magis innumerali that earth sun moon sea and the rest that are not single but innumerable were the most eminent minds of elder times believed it and some of this age of ours compelled by the appearances of human reason do the same forasmuch as in this fabric that we behold there is nothing single and one cum in summares nulla sit una unica quo gignatur et unica solaque crescat since nothing single in this mighty place that can alone beget alone increase and that all the kinds are multiplied in some number by which it seems not to be likely that god should have made this work only without a companion and that the matter of this form should have been totally drained in this individual 
quare etiam atque etiam tales fateare necessa est esse alios alibi congressus materiae qualis hic est avido complexu quem tenet aeter wherefore tis necessary to confess that there must elsewhere be the like congress of the like matter which the airy space holds fast within its infinite embrace especially if it be a living creature which its motions render so credible that plato affirms it and that many of our people do either confirm or dare not deny it no more than that ancient opinion that the heavens the stars and other members of the world are creatures composed of body and soul mortal in respect of their composition but immortal by the determination of the creator now if there be many worlds as democritus epicurus and almost all philosophy has believed what do we know that the principles and rules of this of ours in like manner concern the rest they may peradventure have another form and another polity epicurus supposes them either like or unlike we see in this world an infinite difference and variety only by distance of places neither corn wine nor any of our animals are to be seen in that new corner of the world discovered by our fathers tis all there another thing and in times past do but consider in how many parts of the world they had no knowledge either of bacchus or ceres if pliny and herodotus are to be believed there are in certain places kinds of men very little resembling us mongrel and ambiguous forms betwixt the human and brutal natures there are countries where men are born without heads having their mouth and eyes in their breast where they are all hermaphrodites where they go on all four where they have but one eye in the forehead and a head more like a dog than like ours where they are half fish the lower part and live in the water where the women bear at five years old and live but eight where the head and the skin of the forehead is so hard that a sword will not touch it but rebounds again where men have no beards nations that know not the use of fire others that eject seed of a black color what shall we say of those that naturally change themselves into wolves colts and then into men again and if it be true as plutarch says that in some place of the indies there are men without mouths who nourish themselves with the smell of certain odors how many of our descriptions are false he is no longer risible nor perhaps capable of reason and society the disposition and cause of our internal composition would then for the most part be to no purpose and of no use moreover how many things are there in our own knowledge that oppose those fine rules we have cut out for and prescribe to nature and yet we must undertake to circumscribe thereto god himself how many things do we call miraculous and contrary to nature this is done by every nation and by every man according to the proportion of his ignorance how many occult properties and quintessences do we daily discover for for us to go according to nature is no more but to go 
according to our understanding, as far as that is able to follow, and as far as we are able to see into it, all beyond that is, forsooth, monstrous and irregular. Now, by this account, all things shall be monstrous to the wisest and most understanding men, for human reason has persuaded them that there was no manner of ground nor foundation, not so much as to be assured that snow is white, and Anaxagoras affirmed it to be black. If there be anything, or if there be nothing, if there be knowledge or ignorance, which Metrodorus of Chios denied that man was able to determine, or whether we live, as Euripides doubts whether the life we live is life, or whether that we call death be not life. Tis doiden e zen tus ho kekletai thanein, to zen dithneskein esti. And not without some appearance. For why do we derive the title of being from this instant, which is but a flash in the infinite course of an eternal night, and so short an interruption of our perpetual and natural condition, death possessing all the before and after this moment, and also a good part of the moment itself? Others swear there is no motion at all, as followers of Melissus, and that nothing stirs. For if there be but one, neither can that spherical motion be of any use to him, nor motion from one place to another, as Plato proves, that there is neither generation nor corruption in nature. Protagoras says that there is nothing in nature but doubt, that a man may equally dispute of all things, and even of this, whether a man can equally dispute of all things. Now Siphanes, that of things which seem to be, nothing is more than it is not, that there is nothing certain but uncertainty. Parmenides, that of that which seems there is no one thing in general, that there is but one thing. Zeno, that one same is not, and that there is nothing. If there were one, it would either be in another or in itself. If it be in another, they are two. If it be in itself, they are yet two, the comprehending and the comprehended. According to these doctrines, the nature of things is no other than a shadow, either false or vain. This way of speaking in a Christian man has ever seemed to me very indiscreet and irreverent. God cannot die. God cannot contradict himself. God cannot do this or that. I do not like to have the divine power so limited by the laws of men's mouths, and the idea which presents itself to us in those propositions ought to be more religiously and reverently expressed. Our speaking has its failings and defects as well as all the rest. Most of the occasions of disturbance in the world are grammatical ones. Our suits only spring from disputes as to the interpretation of laws, and most wars proceed from the inability of ministers clearly to express the conventions and treaties of amity of princes. How many quarrels and of how great importance has the doubt of the meaning of this syllable, hoc, created in the world. Let us take 
the clearest conclusion that logic itself presents us withal if you say it is fine weather and that you say true it is then fine weather is not this a very certain form of speaking and yet it will deceive us that it will do so let us follow the example if you say i lie if you say true you do lie the art the reason and force of the conclusion of this are the same with the other and yet we are graveled the pyrrhonian philosophers i see cannot express their general conception in any kind of speaking for they would require a new language on purpose ours is all formed of affirmative propositions which are totally antarctic to them insomuch that when they say i doubt they are presently taken by the throat to make them confess that at least they know and are assured that they do doubt by which means they have been compelled to shelter themselves under this medical comparison without which their humor would be inexplicable when they pronounce i know not or i doubt they say that this proposition carries off itself with the rest no more nor less than rhubarb that drives out the ill humors and carries itself off with them this fancy will be more certainly understood by interrogation what do i know as i bear it with the emblem of a balance see what use they make of this irreverent way of speaking in the present disputes about our religion if you press its adversaries too hard they will roundly tell you that it is not in the power of god to make it so that his body should be in paradise and upon earth and in several places at once and see too what advantage the old scoffer made of this at least says he it is no little consolation to man to see that god cannot do all things for he cannot kill himself though he would which is the greatest privilege we have in our condition he cannot make mortal immortal nor revive the dead nor make it so that he who has lived has not nor that he who has had honours has not had them having no other right to the past than that of oblivion and that the comparison of man to god may yet be made out by jocose examples he cannot order it so says he that twice ten shall not be twenty this is what he says and what a christian ought to take heed shall not escape his lips whereas on the contrary it seems as if men studied this foolish daring of language to reduce god to their own measure cras vel atra nube polum pater occupato vel sole puro non tamen iritum quod cumque retro est efficiet neque defingit infectumque redit quod fugiens semel hora vexit tomorrow let it shine or rain yet cannot this the past make vain nor uncreate and render void that which was yesterday enjoyed when we say that the infinity of ages as well past as to come are but one instant with god that his goodness wisdom and power are the same with his essence our mouths speak it but our understandings apprehend it not and yet such is our vain opinion of ourselves 
that we must make the divinity to pass through our sieve, and thence proceed all the dreams and errors with which the world abounds, whilst we reduce and weigh in our balance a thing so far above our poise. Mirum quo procedat improbitas cordis humani, parvulo aliquo invitata sucesu. Tis wonderful to what the wickedness of man's heart will proceed, if elevated with the least success. How magisterially and insolently does Epicurus reprove the Stoics, for maintaining that the truly good and happy being appertained only to God, and that the wise man had nothing but a shadow and resemblance of it. How temerariously have they bound God to destiny, a thing which, by my consent, none that bears the name of a Christian shall ever do again. And Thales, Plato, and Pythagoras have enslaved him to necessity. This arrogance of attempting to discover God with our eyes has been the cause that an eminent person among us has attributed to the divinity a corporal form, and is the reason of what happens to us every day of attributing to God important events by a particular assignment. Because they weigh with us, they conclude that they also weigh with him, and that he has a more intent and vigilant regard to them than to others of less moment to us or of ordinary course. Magna dii curant, parva negligunt. The gods are concerned at great matters, but slight the small. Listen to him, he will clear this to you by his reason. Nec in regnis quidem reges omnia minima curant. Neither, indeed, do kings in their administration take notice of all the least concerns. As if to that king of kings it were more or less to subvert a kingdom or to move the leaf of a tree or as if his providence acted after another manner in inclining the event of a battle than in the leap of a flea. The hand of his government is laid upon everything after the same manner, with the same power and order. Our interest does nothing towards it. Our inclinations and measures sway nothing with him. Deus ita artifex magnus in magnis, ut minor non sit in parvis. God is so great an artificer in great things, that he is no less in the least. Our arrogancy sets this blasphemous comparison ever before us, because our employments are a burden to us. Strato has courteously been pleased to exempt the gods from all offices, as their priests are. He makes nature produce and support all things, and with her weights and motions make up the several parts of the world, discharging human nature from the awe of divine judgments. Quod beatum aeturnumque sit, id nec habere negotii quisquam, nec exibere altere. What is blessed and eternal has neither any business itself, nor gives any to another. Nature wills that in like things there should be a like relation. The infinite number of mortals, therefore, concludes a like number of immortals. The infinite things that kill and destroy presupposes as many that preserve and profit. As the souls of the gods, without tongue, eye, or ear, 
do every one of them feel amongst themselves what the other feels and judge our thoughts so the souls of men when at liberty and loosed from the body either by sleep or some ecstasy divine foretell and see things which whilst joined to the body they could not see men says st paul professing themselves to be wise they become fools and change the glory of the incorruptible god into an image made like corruptible man do but take notice of the juggling in the ancient deifications after the great and stately pomp of the funeral so soon as the fire began to mount to the top of the pyramid and to catch hold of the couch where the body lay they at the same time turned out an eagle which flying upward signified that the soul went into paradise we have a thousand medals and particularly of the worthy faustina where this eagle is represented carrying these deified souls to heaven with their heels upwards tis pity that we should fool ourselves with our own fopperies and inventions quod finxere timent they fear their own inventions like children who are frighted with the same face of their playfellow that they themselves have smeared and smutted quasi quisquam in felicius sit homine cui sua figmenta dominantur as if anything could be more unhappy than man who is insulted over by his own imagination tis far from honouring him who made us to honour him that we have made augustus had more temples than jupiter served with as much religion and belief of miracles the thracians in return of the benefits they had received from agesilaus came to bring him word that they had canonized him has your nation said he to them the power to make gods of whom they please pray first deify some one amongst yourselves and when i shall see what advantage he has by it i will thank you for your offer man is certainly stark mad he cannot make a worm and yet he will be making gods by dozens here trismegistus in praise of our sufficiency of all the wonderful things it surmounts all wonder that man could find out the divine nature and make it and take here the arguments of the school of philosophy itself nosse cui divos et celi numina soli aut soli nescire datum to whom to know the deities of heaven or know he knows them not alone tis given if there is a god he is a living creature if he be a living creature he has sense and if he has sense he is subject to corruption if he be without a body he is without a soul and consequently without action and if he has a body it is perishable is not here a triumph we are incapable of having made the world there must then be some more excellent nature that has put a hand to the work it were a foolish and ridiculous arrogance to esteem ourselves the most perfect thing of the universe there must then be something that is better and that must be god when you see a stately and stupendous edifice though you do not know who is the owner of it you would yet conclude it was not built for rats 
and this divine structure that we behold of the celestial palace have we not reason to believe that it is the residence of some possessor who is much greater than we is not the most supreme always the most worthy but we are in the lowest form nothing without a soul and without reason can produce a living creature capable of reason the world produces us the world then has soul and reason every part of us is less than we we are part of the world the world therefore is endued with wisdom and reason and that more abundantly than we tis a fine thing to have a great government the government of the world then appertains to some happy nature the stars do us no harm they are then full of goodness we have need of nourishment then so have the gods also and feed upon the vapors of the earth worldly goods are not goods to god therefore they are not goods to us offending and being offended are equally testimonies of imbecility tis therefore folly to fear god god is good by his nature man by his industry which is more the divine and human wisdom have no other distinction but that the first is eternal but duration is no accession to wisdom therefore we are companions we have life reason and liberty we esteem goodness charity and justice these qualities are then in him in conclusion building and destroying the conditions of the divinity are forged by man according as they relate to himself what a pattern and what a model let us stretch let us raise and swell human qualities as much as we please puff up thyself poor man yet more and more and more non si tu ruperis inquit not if thou burst said he profecto non deum quem cogitare non possent sed semet ipsos pro illo cogitantes non illum sed se ipsos non illi sed sibi comparant certainly they do not imagine god whom they cannot imagine but they imagine themselves in his stead they do not compare him but themselves not to him but to themselves in natural things the effects do but half relate to their causes what's this to the purpose his condition is above the order of nature too elevated too remote and too mighty to permit itself to be bound and fettered by our conclusions tis not through ourselves that we arrive at that place our ways lie too low we are no nearer heaven on the top of mount senis than at the bottom of the sea take the distance with your astrolabe they debase god even to the carnal knowledge of women to so many times and so many generations paulina the wife of saturninus a matron of great reputation at rome thinking she lay with the god serapis found herself in the arms of an amoroso of hers through the panderism of the priests of his temple Waro, the most subtle and most learned of all the latin authors in his book of theology 
writes that the sexton of hercules's temple throwing dice with one hand for himself and with the other for hercules played after that manner with him for a supper and a wench if he won at the expense of the offerings if he lost at his own the sexton lost and paid the supper and the wench her name was laurentina who saw by night this god in her arms who moreover told her that the first she met the next day should give her a heavenly reward which proved to be taruntius a rich young man who took her home to his house and in time left her his inheritrix she in her turn thinking to do a thing that would be pleasing to the god left the people of rome heirs to her and therefore had divine honors attributed to her as if it had not been sufficient that plato was originally descended from the gods by a double line and that he had neptune for the common father of his race it was certainly believed at athens that aristo having a mind to enjoy the fair perictione could not and was warned by the god apollo in a dream to leave her unpolluted and untouched till she should first be brought to bed these were the father and mother of plato how many ridiculous stories are there of like cuckoldings committed by the gods against poor mortal men and how many husbands injuriously scandaled in favor of the children in the mahometan religion there are merlins enough found by the belief of the people that is to say children without fathers spiritual divinely conceived in the wombs of virgins and carry names that signify so much in their language end of section 46 section 47 of essays book two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by cynthia moyer essays book two by michel de montaigne translated by charles cotton apology for raymond Sebon, part seven we are to observe that to everything nothing is more dear and estimable than its being the lion the eagle the dolphin prize nothing above their own kind and that everything assimilates the qualities of all other things to its own proper qualities which we may indeed extend or contract but that's all for beyond that relation and principle our imagination cannot go can guess at nothing else nor possibly go out thence nor stretch beyond it whence spring these ancient conclusions of all forms the most beautiful is that of man therefore god must be of that form no one can be happy without virtue nor virtue be without reason and reason cannot inhabit anywhere but in a human shape god is therefore clothed in a human figure ita est informatum et anticipatum mentibus nostris ut homini cum de deo cogitet forma occurat humana it is so imprinted in our minds and the fancy is so prepossessed with it that when a man thinks of god a human figure ever presents itself to the imagination 
Therefore it was that Xenophanes pleasantly said, that if beasts frame any gods to themselves, as tis likely they do, they make them certainly such as themselves are, and glorify themselves in it, as we do. For why may not a goose say thus? All the parts of the universe I have an interest in. The earth serves me to walk upon, the sun to light me, the stars have their influence upon me, I have such an advantage by the winds and such by the waters, there is nothing that yon heavenly roof looks upon so favorably as me. I am the darling of nature. Is it not man that keeps, lodges, and serves me? Tis for me that he both sows and grinds. If he eats me, he does the same by his fellow men, and so do I the worms that kill and devour him as much might be said by a crane, and with greater confidence upon the account of the liberty of his flight and the possession of that high and beautiful region. Tam blanda conciliatrix et tam sui est lena ipsa natura. So flattering and wheedling a bawd is nature to herself. Now by the same consequence the destinies are then for us, for us the world, it shines, it thunders for us, creator and creatures, all are for us. Tis the mark and point to which the universality of things aims. Look into the records that philosophy has kept for two thousand years and more, of the affairs of heaven. The gods all that while have neither acted nor spoken but for man. She does not allow them any other consultation or occupation. See them here against us in war. Domitosque Herculea manu telluris juvenis unde periculum fulgens contremuit domus Saturni veteris. The brawny sons of earth, subdued by hand, of Hercules on the Phlegraean strand, where the rude shock did such an uproar make as made old Saturn's sparkling palace shake. And here you shall see them participate of our troubles, to make a return for our having so often shared in theirs. Neptunus muros magnoque emota tridenti, fundamenta quatit, totamque a sedibus urbem eruit, hic juno scaes saevissima portas prima tenet. Amidst that smother, Neptune holds his place, below the wall's foundation drives his mace, and heaves the city from its solid base. See where in arms the cruel Juno stands, full in the Scaean gate. The Caunians, jealous of the authority of their own proper gods, armed themselves on the days of their devotion, and through the whole of their precincts ran, cutting and slashing the air with their swords, by that means to drive away and banish all foreign gods out of their territory. Their powers are limited according to our necessity. This cures horses, that men, that the plague, that the scurf, that the phthisic. One cures one sort of itch, another another. Adeo minimis etiam rebus prava religio inserit deos. At such a rate does false religion create gods for the most contemptible uses. This one makes grapes grow, that onions. This has the precedence over lechery, that over merchandise. For every sort of artisan a god. This has his province and reputation in the east, that his in the west. Hic ilius arma, hic curus fuit. Here lay her armor, 
here her chariot stood o sancte apollo qui umbilicum certum terrarum obtines o sacred phoebus who with glorious ray from the earth's centre dost thy light display palada cecropidae minoia creta dianam vulcanum tellus hypsipilea colit junonem sparte pelopeadesque micenae pinigerum fauni mainalis ora caput mars latio venerandus erat the athenians palace cynthia crete adore vulcan is worshipped on the lemnian shore proud juno's altars are by spartans fed the arcadians worship faunus and tis said to mars by italy is homage paid this has only one town or family in his possession that lives alone that in company either voluntary or upon necessity Junctaque sunt magno templa nepotis avo and temples to the nephew joined are to those were reared to the great grandfather in here are some so wretched and mean for the number amounts to six and thirty thousand that they must pack five or six together to produce one ear of corn and thence take their several names three to a door that of the plank that of the hinge and that of the threshold four to a child protectors of his swathing clouts his drink meat and sucking some certain some uncertain and doubtful and some that are not yet entered paradise quos quoniam celi nondum dignamor honore quas dedimus certe terras habitare sinamus whom since we yet not worthy think of heaven we suffer to possess the earth we've given there are amongst them physicians poets and civilians some of a mean betwixt the divine and human nature mediators betwixt god and us adorned with a certain second and diminutive sort of adoration infinite in titles and offices some good others ill some old and decrepit and some that are mortal for chrysippus was of opinion that in the last conflagration of the world all the gods were to die but jupiter man makes a thousand pretty societies betwixt god and him is he not his countryman jovis in cunabula cretin crete the cradle of jupiter and this is the excuse that upon consideration of this subject skywola a high priest and waro a great theologian in their times make us that it is necessary that the people should be ignorant of many things that are true and believe many things that are false cum veritatem qua liberetur inquirat credatur ei expedire quod falitur seeing he inquires into the truth by which he would be made free tis fit he should be deceived human eyes cannot perceive things but by the forms they know and we do not remember what a leap miserable phaeton took for attempting to guide his father's horses with a mortal hand the mind of man falls into as great a depth and is after the same manner bruised and shattered by his own rashness if you ask of philosophy of what matter the heavens and the sun are what answer will she return if not that it is iron or with anaxagoras stone or some other matter that she makes use of if a man inquire of zeno what nature is a fire 
says he, an artisan, proper for generation and regularly proceeding. Archimedes, master of that science which attributes to itself the precedency before all others for truth and certainty, the sun, says he, is a god of red-hot iron. Was not this a fine imagination extracted from the inevitable necessity of geometrical demonstrations? Yet not so inevitable and useful, but that Socrates thought it was enough to know so much of geometry only as to measure the land a man bought or sold. And that Polyinus, who had been a great and famous doctor in it, despised it, as full of falsity and manifest vanity, after he had once tasted the delicate fruits of the lozily gardens of Epicurus. Socrates, in Xenophon, concerning this affair, says of Anaxagoras, reputed by antiquity learned above all others in celestial and divine matters, that he had cracked his brain, as all other men do, who too immoderately search into knowledges which nothing belong to them. When he made the sun to be a burning stone, he did not consider that a stone does not shine in the fire, and, which is worse, that it will there consume. And in making the sun and fire one, that fire does not turn the complexions black in shining upon them, that we are able to look fixedly upon fire, and that fire kills herbs and plants. Tis Socrates' opinion, and mine too, that the best judging of heaven is not to judge of it at all. Plato, having occasion, in his Timaeus, to speak of the demons, this undertaking, says he, exceeds my ability. We are therefore to believe those ancients who said they were begotten by them. Tis against all reason to refuse a man's faith to the children of the gods, though what they say should not be proved by any necessary or probable reasons, seeing they engage to speak of domestic and familiar things. Let us see if we have a little more light in the knowledge of human and natural things. Is it not a ridiculous attempt for us to forge for those to whom, by our own confession, our knowledge is not able to attain, another body and to lend a false form of our own invention, as is manifest in this motion of the planets, to which seeing our wits cannot possibly arrive, nor conceive their natural conduct, we lend them material, heavy, and substantial springs of our own by which to move. Temo aureus aurea sumai, curvatura rotai, radiorum argenteus ordo. Gold was the axle, and the beam was gold, the wheels with silver spokes on golden circles rolled. You would say that we had had coachmakers, carpenters, and painters that went up on high to make engines of various motions, and to range the wheelwork and interfacings of the heavenly bodies of differing colors about the axis of necessity, according to Plato. Mundus domus est maxima rerum, quam quinque altitonae fragmine zonae, cingunt per quam limbus pictus bis sex signis, stelimicantibus altus in obliquo aetera, lunae bigas aceptat. The world's a mansion that doth all things hold, which thundering zones in number five enfold through which a girdle painted with twelve signs, and that with sparkling constellations shines, 
in heaven's arch marks the diurnal course for the sun's chariot and his fiery horse these are all dreams and fanatic follies why will not nature please for once to lay open her bosom to us and plainly discover to us the means and conduct of her movements and prepare our eyes to see them good god what abuse what mistakes should we discover in our poor science i am mistaken if that weak knowledge of ours holds any one thing as it really is and i shall depart hence more ignorant of all other things than my own ignorance have i not read in plato this divine saying that nature is nothing but enigmatic poesy as if a man might perhaps see a veiled and shady picture breaking out here and there with an infinite variety of false lights to puzzle our conjectures latent ista omnia crassis occultata et circumfusa tenebres ut nulla acies humani ingenii tanta sit quae penetrare in celum teram intrare posit all those things lie concealed and involved in so dark an obscurity that no point of human wit can be so sharp as to pierce heaven or penetrate the earth and certainly philosophy is no other than sophisticated poetry whence do the ancient writers extract their authorities but from the poets and the first of them were poets themselves and writ accordingly plato is but a poet unripped timon calls him insultingly a monstrous forger of miracles all superhuman sciences make use of the poetic style just as women make use of teeth of ivory where the natural are wanting and instead of their true complexion make one of some artificial matter as they stuff themselves out with cotton to appear plump and in the sight of every one do paint patch and trick up themselves with a false and borrowed beauty so does science and even our law itself has they say legitimate fictions whereon it builds the truth of its justice she gives us in presupposition and for current pay things which she herself informs us were invented for these epicycles eccentrics and concentrics which astrology makes use of to carry on the motions of the stars she gives us for the best she could invent upon that subject as also in all the rest philosophy presents us not that which really is or what she really believes but what she has contrived with the greatest and most plausible likelihood of truth and the quaintest invention plato upon the discourse of the state of human bodies and those of beasts says i should know that what i have said is truth had i the confirmation of an oracle but this i will affirm that what i have said is the most likely to be true of anything i could say tis not to heaven only that art sends her ropes engines and wheels let us consider a little what she says of us ourselves and of our contexture there is not more retrogradation trepidation accession recession and astonishment in the stars and celestial bodies than they have found out in this poor little human body in earnest they have good reason upon that very account to call it the little world so many tools and parts have they employed to erect and build it to assist the motions they see in man and the various functions that we find in ourselves in how many parts have they divided the soul 
in how many places lodged it in how many orders have they divided and to how many stories have they raised this poor creature man besides those that are natural and to be perceived and how many offices and vocations have they assigned him they make it an imaginary public thing tis a subject that they hold and handle and they have full power granted to them to rip place displace piece and stuff it every one according to his own fancy and yet they possess it not they cannot not in reality only but even in dreams so govern it that there will not be some cadence or sound that will escape their architecture as enormous as it is and botched with a thousand false and fantastic patches and it is not reason to excuse them for though we are satisfied with painters when they paint heaven earth seas mountains and remote islands that they give us some slight mark of them and as of things unknown are content with a faint and obscure description yet when they come and draw us after life or any other creature which is known and familiar to us we then require of them a perfect and exact representation of lineaments and colors and despise them if they fail in it i am very well pleased with the milesian girl who observing the philosopher thales to be always contemplating the celestial arch and to have his eyes ever gazing upward laid something in his way that he might stumble over to put him in mind that it would be time to take up his thoughts about things that are in the clouds when he had provided for those that were under his feet doubtless she advised him well rather to look to himself than to gaze at heaven for as democritus says by the mouth of cicero quod est ante pedes nemo spectat celi scrutantur plagas no man regards what is under his feet they are always prying towards heaven but our condition will have it so that the knowledge of what we have in hand is as remote from us and as much above the clouds as that of the stars as socrates says in plato that whoever meddles with philosophy may be reproached as thales was by the woman that he sees nothing of that which is before him for every philosopher is ignorant of what his neighbor does ay and of what he does himself and is ignorant of what they both are whether beasts or men those people who find sebon's arguments too weak that are ignorant of nothing that govern the world that know all quae mare compescant causae quid temperet anum stellae sponte sua iusaue vagentur et erent quid premat obscurum lunae quid proferat orbem quid velit et possit rerum concordia discors what governs ocean's tides and through the various year the seasons guides whether the stars by their own proper force or foreign power pursue their wandering course why shadows darken the pale queen of night whence she renews her orb and spreads her light what nature's jarring sympathy can mean have they not sometimes in their writings sounded the difficulties they have met with of knowing their own being we see very well that the finger moves that the foot moves that some parts assume a voluntary motion of themselves without our consent and that others work by our direction that one sort of apprehension occasions blushing another paleness 
such an imagination works upon the spleen only another upon the brain one occasions laughter another tears another stupefies and astonishes all our senses and arrests the motion of all our members at one object the stomach will rise at another a member that lies something lower but how a spiritual impression should make such a breach into a massy and solid subject and the nature of the connection and contexture of these admirable springs and movements never yet man knew omnia incerterratione et in naturae majestate abdita all uncertain in reason and concealed in the majesty of nature says pliny and st augustine modus quo corporibus adhirent spiritus omninu mirus est nec comprehendi ab homine potest et hoc ipse homo est the manner whereby souls adhere to bodies is altogether wonderful and cannot be conceived by man and yet this is man and yet it is not so much as doubted for the opinions of men are received according to the ancient belief by authority and upon trust as if it were religion and law tis received as gibberish which is commonly spoken this truth with all its clutter of arguments and proofs is admitted as a firm and solid body that is no more to be shaken no more to be judged of on the contrary every one according to the best of his talent corroborates and fortifies this received belief with the utmost power of his reason which is a supple utensil pliable and to be accommodated to any figure and thus the world comes to be filled with lies and fopperies the reason that men doubt of diverse things is that they never examine common impressions they do not dig to the root where the faults and defects lie they only debate upon the branches they do not examine whether such and such a thing be true but if it has been so and so understood it is not inquired into whether galen has said anything to purpose but whether he has said so or so in truth it was very good reason that this curb to the liberty of our judgments and that tyranny over our opinions should be extended to the schools and arts the god of scholastic knowledge is aristotle tis irreligion to question any of his decrees as it was those of lycurgus at sparta his doctrine is a magisterial law which peradventure is as false as another i do not know why i should not as willingly embrace either the ideas of plato or the atoms of epicurus or the plenum or vacuum of leucippus and democritus or the water of thales or the infinity of nature of anaximander or the air of diogenes or the numbers and symmetry of pythagoras or the infinity of parmenides or the one of musaeus or the water and fire of apollodorus or the similar parts of anaxagoras or the discord and friendship of empedocles or the fire of heraclitus or any other opinion of that infinite confusion of opinions and determinations which this fine human reason produces by its certitude and clear-sightedness in everything it meddles withal as i should the opinion of aristotle upon this subject of the principles of natural things which principles he builds of three pieces matter form and privation 
and what can be more vain than to make inanity itself the cause of the production of things privation is a negative of what humour could he then make the cause and original of things that are and yet that were not to be controverted but for the exercise of logic there is nothing disputed therein to bring it into doubt but to defend the author of the school from foreign objections his authority is the non ultra beyond which it is not permitted to inquire it is very easy upon approved foundations to build whatever we please for according to the law and ordering of this beginning the other parts of the structure are easily carried on without any failure by this way we find our reason well grounded and discourse at a venture for our masters prepossess and gain beforehand as much room in our belief as is necessary towards concluding afterwards what they please as geometricians do by their granted demands the consent and approbation we allow them giving them wherewith to draw us to the right and left and to whirl us about at their pleasure whatever springs from these presuppositions is our master and our god he will take the level of his foundations so ample and so easy that by them he may mount us up to the clouds if he so please in this practice and negotiation of science we have taken the saying of pythagoras that every expert person ought to be believed in his own art for current pay the logician refers the signification of words to the grammarians the rhetorician borrows the state of arguments from the logician the poet his measure from the musician the geometrician his proportions from the arithmetician and the metaphysicians take physical conjectures for their foundations for every science has its principle presupposed by which human judgment is everywhere kept in check if you come to rush against the bar where the principal error lies they have presently this sentence in their mouths that there is no disputing with persons who deny principles now men can have no principles if not revealed to them by the divinity of all the rest the beginning the middle and the end is nothing but dream and vapour to those that contend upon presupposition we must on the contrary presuppose to them the same axiom upon which the dispute is for every human presupposition and declaration has as much authority one as another if reason do not make the difference wherefore they are all to be put into the balance and first the generals and those that tyrannize over us the persuasion of certainty is a certain testimony of folly and extreme incertainty and there are not a more foolish sort of men nor that are less philosophers than the philodoxes of plato we must inquire whether fire be hot whether snow be white if there be any such things as hard or soft within our knowledge and as to those answers of which they make old stories as he that doubted if there was any such thing as heat whom they bid throw himself into the fire and he that denied the coldness of ice whom they bid to put ice into his bosom they are pitiful things unworthy of the profession of philosophy if they had let us alone in our natural being to receive the appearance of things without us according as they present themselves to us by our senses 
and had permitted us to follow our own natural appetites governed by the condition of our birth they might then have reason to talk at that rate but tis from them we have learned to make ourselves judges of the world tis from them that we derive this fancy that human reason is controller general of all that is without and within the roof of heaven that comprehends everything that can do everything by the means of which everything is known and understood this answer would be good among the cannibals who enjoy the happiness of a long quiet and peaceable life without aristotle's precepts and without the knowledge of the name of physics this answer would perhaps be of more value and greater force than all those they borrow from their reason and invention of this all animals and all where the power of the law of nature is yet pure and simple would be as capable as we but as for them they have renounced it they need not tell us it is true for you to see and feel it to be so they must tell me whether i really feel what i think i do and if i do feel it they must then tell me why i feel it and how and what let them tell me the name original the parts and junctures of heat and cold the qualities of the agent and patient or let them give up their profession which is not to admit or approve of anything but by the way of reason that is their test in all sorts of essays but certainly tis a test full of falsity error weakness and defect which way can we better prove it than by itself if we are not to believe her when speaking of herself she can hardly be thought fit to judge of foreign things if she know anything it must at least be her own being and abode she is in the soul and either a part or an effect of it for true and essential reason from which we by a false color borrow the name is lodged in the bosom of the almighty there is her habitation and recess tis thence that she imparts her rays when god is pleased to impart any beam of it to mankind as pallas issued from her father's head to communicate herself to the world now let us see what human reason tells us of herself and of the soul not of the soul in general of which almost all philosophy makes the celestial and first bodies participants nor of that which thales attributed to things which themselves are reputed inanimate led thereto by the consideration of the lodestone but of that which appertains to us and that we ought the best to know ignoratur enim quae sit natura animae nata sit an contra nascentibus insinuetur et simul intereat nobiscum morte diremta an tenebris orci visat vastasque lacunas an pecudes alias divinitus insinuet se for none the nature of the soul doth know whether that it be born with us or no or be infused into us at our birth and dies with us when we return to earth or then descends to the black shades below or into other animals does go crates and dicaearchus were of opinion that there was no soul at all but that the body thus stirs by a natural motion plato that it was a substance moving of itself thales a nature without repose asclepiades an exercising of the senses hesiod and anaximander 
a thing composed of earth and water, Parmenides of earth and fire, Empedocles of blood. Sanguineam vomit ille animam. He vomits up his bloody soul. Posidonius, Cleanthes, and Galen, that it was heat or a hot complexion. Igneus est oles vigor et calestis origo. Their vigor of fire and of heavenly race. Hippocrates, a spirit diffused all over the body. Varro, that it was an air received at the mouth, heated in the lungs, moistened in the heart, and diffused throughout the whole body. Zeno, the quintessence of the four elements. Heraclides Ponticus, that it was the light. Xenocrates and the Egyptians, a mobile number. The Chaldeans, a virtue without any determinate form. Habitum quem dam vitalem corporis essa, harmoniam graeci quam dicunt. A certain vital habit in man's frame, which harmony the Grecian sages name. Let us not forget Aristotle, who held the soul to be that which naturally causes the body to move, which he calls entelechia, with as cold an invention as any of the rest, for he neither speaks of the essence, nor of the original, nor of the nature of the soul, but only takes notice of the effect. Lactantius, Seneca, and most of the dogmatists have confessed that it was a thing they did not understand after all this enumeration of opinions. Harum sententiarum quo vera sit, Deus aliquis videret. Of these opinions, which is the true, let some God determine, says Cicero. I know by myself, says St. Bernard, how incomprehensible God is, seeing I cannot comprehend the parts of my own being. Heraclitus, who was of opinion that every being was full of souls and demons, did nevertheless maintain that no one could advance so far towards the knowledge of the soul as ever to arrive at it, so profound was the essence of it. Neither is there less controversy and debate about seating of it. Hippocrates and Hierophilus place it in the ventricle of the brain. Democritus and Aristotle throughout the whole body. Ut bona saepe valetudo cum dicitur esse corporis et non est tamen haec pars ulla valentis as when the body's health they do it call, when of a sound man that's no part at all. Epicurus in the stomach. Hic exultat enim pavor ac metus, haec loca circum laetitiae mulcent. For this the seat of horror is and fear, and joys in turn do likewise triumph here. The Stoics about and within the heart, Aristratus adjoining the membrane of the Epicranium, Empedocles in the blood, as also Moses, which was the reason why he interdicted eating the blood of beasts, because the soul is there seated. Galen thought that every part of the body had its soul. Strato has placed it betwixt the eyebrows. Qua facia quidem sit animus, aut ubi habitet, ne quirendum quidem est. What figure the soul is of, or what part it inhabits, is not to be inquired into, says Cicero. I very willingly deliver this author to you in his own words, for should I alter eloquence itself? Besides, it were but 
a poor prize to steal the matter of his inventions they are neither very frequent nor of any great weight and sufficiently known but the reason why chrysippus argues it to be about the heart as all the rest of that sect do is not to be omitted it is says he because when we would affirm any things we lay our hand upon our breasts and when we would pronounce ego which signifies i we let the lower jaw fall towards the stomach this place ought not to be passed over without a remark upon the vanity of so great a man for besides that these considerations are infinitely light in themselves the last is only a proof to the greeks that they have their souls lodged in that part no human judgment is so sprightly and vigilant that it does not sometimes sleep why do we fear to say the stoics the fathers of human prudence think that the soul of a man crushed under a ruin long labors and strives to get out like a mouse caught in a trap before it can disengage itself from the burden some hold that the world was made to give bodies by way of punishment to the spirits fallen by their own fault from the purity wherein they had been created the first creation having been incorporeal and that according as they are more or less depraved from their spirituality so are they more or less jocundly or dully incorporated and that thence proceeds all the variety of so much created matter but the spirit that for his punishment was invested with the body of the sun must certainly have a very rare and particular measure of change end of section 47